from challenging times like no other. We've all worked together like no other people can work together. We've come such a long way from there to here. We've done so much, shared so much, learned so much about who we are, what we have, what we can do, and how much more we want to do. We know that supporting each other is our way forward, and that's why our support continues to drive our industry's giant ambition. With truly epic, world-class visitor experiences, tailored industry training and marketing campaigns, a comprehensive series of business mentoring and advice programs, sales missions, research, insights and events. Support of this depth and scale proves just how much we're all in this together, sharing that same giant ambition. And with our legendary giant spirit behind us, we know we'll get there, together. There's no time to waste, and there's no time like the present. So, let's go. Good morning, everyone. A big round of applause for our fabulous uh, video. Absolutely delighted to welcome you all here today for the return of our flagship Northern Ireland Tourism Conference. It's been a while, but I must say it's fabulous to see so many people in the room today and uh, we are up for a real treat. I hope you enjoyed that short video as I suppose a reminder to us all of the fantastic destination that Northern Ireland is and the dynamic industry that you all represent. So the focus of this year is, of course, an innovative and sustainable future. And we'll be focusing on topics affecting the future of the tourism industry. Lots to talk about today, as well as putting a spotlight on plans to support regeneration and growth. Now, a little bit of housekeeping before we start. We're not expecting any fire drills. So if one goes off today, I'm afraid we'll have to move outside. Uh, but first of all, um, I'm delighted uh, to welcome the Minister uh, for the Economy, Gordon Lyons, MLA, who's going to say a few words and then he needs to head off for some important uh, business. <laughs> Minister, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. It's great to, to be here, and I have to apologise. I do have to leave uh, shortly after to uh, head to the Assembly. Um, but um, it is great to, to be with you first, and I do want to thank Tourism uh, NI for the invitation to uh, speak here uh, today. Um, it's great to be here in, in, in person and to be speaking to such a packed uh, room. Uh, and for the, from the numbers that are here today, it's very clear that there is a huge enthusiasm for and a belief in our ability to return this industry to growth. And today's range of uh, expert speakers will, I have no doubt, uh, leave you feeling inspired, informed, and even more engaged with the task ahead. I would uh, like to extend a particularly warm welcome uh, to uh, Alex on her first visit to Belfast. Uh, Alex is one of the best known, uh, most passionate, supportive and straightforward figures in the hospitality industry and will, I am sure, give you all plenty of no-nonsense insights and encouragement. And I need not remind anyone in the room what an exceptionally difficult period the last two years has been. And my primary objective during the crisis was to bring, where possible, much needed business through the doors of our visitor attractions, uh, hotels, and hospitality venues across the whole of Northern Ireland. And I wish to commend the tourism agencies, all of you here today, and those in my own department, for your unrelenting commitment and tireless efforts. While the effects of the pandemic were at times overwhelming, there was no shortage of inspiring and innovative responses from everyone across Northern Ireland. And I offer my sincere gratitude for your resilience. We have delivered so much through our Tourism Recovery Action Plan. 
and continue to do so. Over the last two years, we managed to secure £31 million of COVID recovery funding, which we invested in a range of activities to respond to the challenges presented by the pandemic. This included a number of heavyweight marketing campaigns delivered by Tourism NI and Tourism Ireland across the UK and Ireland, which I'm delighted to say really helped to boost consumer confidence and stimulate much needed demand. As Minister, I also had the pleasure of launching a wide variety of innovative support schemes delivered by Tourism NI to ensure the survival of tourism businesses and prepare them for the long road to recovery and growth. During COVID, we found new and innovative approaches to work with overseas tour operators and use virtual platforms to promote Northern Ireland in international markets as a world-class golf um, travel and conference destination. More recently, we have been upping our support to the industry uh, to travel again to overseas markets and secure important bookings for future years. And over the past year, I was pleased to join Tourism Ireland in a number of our important overseas markets to meet with key members of the travel trade and media and to see at first hand the great work that they are doing on the ground to promote Northern Ireland. Last October, I was in London for Tourism Ireland's annual Flavours of Ireland event, and again in November to attend the World Travel Market. And this year, I joined Tourism Ireland sales missions to the Middle East in February and New York in March. And each time, I met with key local travel professionals who were unanimous in their praise of Northern Ireland as a place to visit, to do business, and importantly, to sell to their clients as a holiday destination. And it is important that we support the tourism industry here in Northern Ireland to regain the ground lost over the past two years and work together with Tourism Ireland and Tourism NI to ensure that we quickly return to the record visitor and revenue numbers uh, that we witnessed in 2019. Getting out to our main markets and having face-to-face -face contact with potential clients really does pay off and I would urge you all to take those occasional sales opportunities uh, as and when appropriate for your businesses. Other work has included an extensive skills campaign in partnership with key stakeholders. We recognise the need for an innovative approach to the skills crisis, which if we do not address, will have a devastating impact on our industry in the near future. And I know that many of you are struggling to fill current vacancies. But in partnership with the Hatch Network, we have launched a widespread heavyweight tactile campaign across Northern Ireland from January to March this year. And the results are impressive, but more needs to be done. Research undertaken as part of the campaign will help inform and support the industry to attract and retain the right people with the right skills to make profitable growth. And we need to work with you to make this happen. As we already know from listening carefully to our visitors, that our people are our greatest asset. And I'm delighted that later on you'll be hearing from uh, Johnny Cole Hamilton from the RNA about their plans uh, for the return of the Open to Royal Port Rush in 2025. Many of us in Northern Ireland still regard the 148th Open in 2019 as the pinnacle of our tourism journey before the arrival of the COVID pandemic. And the RNA's decision to bring the Open back to our shores so quickly is testament to the quality of the course, the exceptional collaboration through Team Northern Ireland in delivering global events, and the giant spirit which we shared with all of our guests during that time in July 2019. And I look forward to what will be an even bigger and better event in 2025. I'm pleased that the core themes of today's conference are innovation and sustainability. Last year, I published our 10x strategy, an economic vision for a decade of innovation for Northern Ireland. There are few industries which have embraced the digital revolution quite like the travel and tourism industries. And the evolution of new tourism experiences right across the country shows that innovation continues to be at the forefront of the development of the industry here. You will also be aware that in March of this year, the Assembly agreed to a climate change bill, 
bringing Northern Ireland into line with the rest of the UK by committing to a net zero carbon emission target by 2050. The tourism industry has a major role to play in achieving that target. And one of the key actions in our Tourism Recovery Action Plan is the development of a regenerative tourism strategy. This will not only help us to achieve those emission targets, but doing it in a way which will enhance our built and natural environment, support local communities and create sustainable employment across every part of Northern Ireland. And I look forward to being able to progress this strategy very soon. It just remains for me to wish you all a hugely uh, successful conference. I hope that you find today's programme to be enjoyable, uh, thought-provoking, but most importantly, helpful to you and your businesses as we embark upon the next stage of our journey to recovery and sustainable growth in the years ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to the Minister. Great to hear about his support for a regenerative uh, tourism strategy going forward. There's a hashtag today if you want to tell everyone where you are and uh, all about the discussions and the topics uh, on show here today. It's hashtag NITourismConf22. Uh, it's uh, along the front here on the podium. Uh, we are going to take a couple of breaks today. We'd be urging you to take a look around the dedicated expo that we have here today, giving you the opportunity today to meet with a range of teams from across Tourism NI and Tourism Ireland, and to discuss the opportunities coming up, including the golf, marketing, industry development, business tourism, experience development, and accommodation certification and classification. So, a couple of breaks uh, coming up today, just to, everybody likes to know when they can take a break. Uh, we'll be having our first one at 11.25 and lunch will be at 1.20. The expo area will remain open until around 3.30 today, so you know what, you're out. Get networking, get talking, get chatting, and everybody will be loving to hear what you have to say and ask all of those questions. Uh, we have, as uh, the Minister already alluded to, a packed schedule coming up for you in such a short space of time. Um, following a, a talk and a welcome by the Chief Executive of Tourism Northern Ireland, John McGrillan, uh, John will then be followed by our sustainability experts, Professor Javier Font and Tina, o Tina O'Dwyer. And then, as we've already heard, we'll be hearing from the Championship Director of the Open, Johnny Cole Hamilton. As a North Coast girl, I'm very excited about that one. Um, after the break, we have Dr. Paul Redmond, who will have a fascinating presentation for you uh, on the graduate market. So just who are we appealing to and are we, are we marketing to them in the correct way? And followed uh, by a fantastic discussion with somebody who I've met this morning and she's absolutely wonderful, hotelier, businesswoman, and of course the hotel inspector, Alex Polizzi. It's all about the bright suits today from Zara, apparently, although Alex has worn her trainers. We're having a big discussion about why I've reconformed and worn my heels today after we've been in trainers for a couple of years, but really excited to hear what Alex has to say. Alex also opened um, a hotel just last year, so uh, she knows how difficult it has been and has actually walked the walk as well as uh, talked the talk. Um, so we, if you have any questions at all, I'd love to be able to put those to Alex or to our speakers today. We'll have a panel at the end uh, where if you want to scribble notes down, make sure that you put your hand up and we will put those questions to you. What we have here at Gal Garden is everything the visitor needs, all in one place, under one roof. We have a mixture of unique accommodation, the spa, which sits over six acres on a 400 acre estate, what has been successful with Tourism Northern Ireland has been the marketing campaigns that they've run, the development piece and the staff training over the last number of years. They understand what events do and what the economic piece around events and what they bring into the overall economy. So it's about continuing the good work that's been done in the past um, and really then starting to work towards scaling what hopefully will be a great future over the next number of years. Right, okay, a welcome now from the Chief Executive of Tourism NI. John McGrillan. Okay, 
Thank, thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. And good morning, everyone, and welcome. And I'm absolutely delighted to be standing here with you, uh, folk, all in, in person for our conference this year. And it's great to see so many people in the room and so many people from uh, the tourism family all here together. I would like to thank Minister Lyons for joining us this morning. He is a very, very busy man and for his words of welcome. And congratulations to him uh, on topping the poll in uh, East Antrim and retaining the seat, and it, it's good to see him back. I'd also like to thank the Minister for the fantastic support that we got from the Department of the Economy over the last two years to support the industry through the pandemic. Uh, and in the last financial year, we were given somewhere in the region of about £22 million to support the industry through the Department's Tourism Recovery Action Plan. And hopefully, many of you who are here today have been the beneficiaries of that support and the many programmes that we were able to run as a result of having that. Um, and as we reflect, I think, on the last two years and, and hopefully becoming much more optimistic about the future, um, we've all had huge challenges to overcome. And if there's one thing that really sort of stands out for me over the last two years, it's just been the incredible resilience that the tourism industry and all of you people in the room have shown over that period of time. I mean, you had to close businesses at short notice, you had to reopen businesses, you had to deal with um, a whole range of restrictions. Um, and there was a whole host of other things that were thrown in your direction, and I mean, we've come out the other end of that in, in, in a very positive fashion. And I think whilst you know, it has a very, a very challenging period uh, for, for many of us, um, the partnerships and, and the, the uh, working together that has been happening across the tourism and hospitality sector for many years has really been strengthened as a part of that experience. And I would like to say thanks to the councils, to the Northern Ireland Hotel Federation, Hospitality Ulster, um, our DMOs and Visit Derry, Visit Belfast, the Tourism Alliance, Tourism Ireland, all who've played a really major role in helping to roll out a programme of support, giving advice to the industry, and I suppose keeping the tourism agenda um, at the top of ministers' um, portfolios and making sure that the media were aware of the challenge that we faced and had the support of the, uh, the I suppose, our, our, our population to, to help us recover from, from what we had faced. Um, and I would like to say a special thanks to my own staff because they performed heroically over that period of time and you know, their, their commitment was really unstinting and they did a fantastic job. In keeping with our conference theme today, I think innovation has really helped us to drive uh, the recovery from uh, the, the effects of the pandemic. And we've had to adapt to new ways of working. We've embraced a new brand and embraced a giant spirit. We've had a very successful new call to action and a small step to a giant adventure. And we're delighted to see new product come onto the market. We're delighted to see the opening of the Game of Thrones studio tour down in Ban Bridge. If you haven't been, it's absolutely world class. It's a fantastic new visitor attraction. We've seen a revamping of the W5 at the Odyssey Arena. And again, you know, that, that is a really new, fantastic experience. And there's a whole raft of new experiences and activities supported through our experience development program which has really allowed us to achieve cut through, uh, particularly in the Republic of Ireland market. And we, and we know that last summer you know, was a really positive one, uh, with visitor spend in hotels, bars, eating places and attractions up by a quarter on the same period in 2019. And spend by residents in the Republic of Ireland more than doubled during that particular period. And here at home, we saw a third uh, or 33% increase in domestic spend and Unbelievably, we also saw a 10% growth in the spend which came from uh, the GB market. And the online reviews that have been left by the people who stayed here sort of demonstrates that the experience that you have given people over that period of time has been second to none and has been really positive. Our consumer research uh, that we've done recently indicates that approximately half of the people who came from Ireland to the Republic of Ireland uh, to Northern Ireland over that period of time were first-time leisure visitors, and about two-thirds of those people have said that they do plan to come back. So that is a really significant shift, I would argue, in our performance and our perception in that important market for us. And we've done further work in terms of market segmentation. There's lots of really useful information available on tourismandi.com. And as we run with our campaigns next year, I think it'd be really helpful uh, for you guys to tap into that and look to see how you make the most of that. The research is also showing us that whilst you know, there's a huge demand now for sun destinations because people haven't really been able to get away, there's still a really strong interest uh, from all markets in Northern Ireland for the spring and the summer of this year. Um, 
The industry data that we've got shows that there's really strong forward bookings in the hotel sector. Uh, the tour operators are telling us that they've got strong order books. And the consumer surveys that we have done would suggest that one in five people here are planning to take a short break in the, um, in the late spring and early summer. We're seeing the same indication coming from the Republic of Ireland. And one in seven people down there are sort of saying they're considering a long break here over, um, over the summer period. And certainly the research that's been done by Tourism Ireland and the international marketplace would also echo that. That demand is still there for the island of Ireland, despite the fact that people are looking at those some destinations. We're also seeing the return of the events. Uh, we've got the Northwest 200 happening this weekend. Uh, we're seeing conferences coming back to venues such as this. Um, see Rachel sitting down here. Um, we visit Belfast and Cruise Belfast are already welcoming cruise ships back into Belfast. And we're going to see more cruise ships arrive here than we ever had before. So from in the short term, you know, from a, certainly from a demand point of view, everything looks extremely positive. The return of air access in the longer term is going to be really important to us as well. Um, onto the island of Ireland and maintaining Northern Ireland's domestic air routes and building up our international air connectivity is, is really critical to that success. And it's really great to know that by the summer of this year, it's anticipated that 92% of the 2019 seat capacity into Ireland uh, will have returned. And, and we're looking at a figure of around 75% here. So it's really great to see that Fly B is back operating out of the George Best International Airport. That's really important for our connectivity into GB, which is a really important market for us. And I suppose it demonstrates that the conditions uh, required for recovery and future growth are there. And um, it's a real vote of confidence, I think, in Belfast that Fly B have decided to um, identify Belfast as its, its second base in the UK. Um, Moving into the current financial year, um, for us, unfortunately, we're not going to have that £22 million pounds that, that we did have last year. Um, so we won't have the same resources available to us. But we will continue with our marketing campaigns. We intend to run three campaigns again this year. We want to support businesses by giving them financial support with their marketing activity, which has been really crucial, I think, in converting our sort of promotional messages into uh, bed nights and, and into visitor spends. We will continue with our TED programme, and we're going to have a really strong focus on uh, sustainability this year. And as always, we'll be working very closely with our colleagues in Tourism Ireland to you know, pick up the momentum in the international marketplace. And one of those things that we will really focus on uh, are the international media visits, which have been missing for so long, and which are so important in driving future business in those international markets. So we will continue to support you as best we can and driving demands so that you have got the turnover coming through your doors um, to hopefully operate on a, on a profitable basis. So um, please take the opportunity to chat to our teams from Tourism Ireland and Tourism NI who are available on the stands today, as Sarah has said, um, and take the opportunity to discuss with them the many ways in which we hope we can help you and your business in, in the year ahead. I suppose it's also fair to say that you know, we've come through a really tumultuous period of time and we've just come out the back end of that and we're now facing a whole new range of challenges um, within the industry. Everyone is seeing overheads increase, energy costs are going up, raw material costs are going up, um, food and labour costs are increasing and of course here in this part of the island we're facing a 20% VAT rate um, which has gone up from 5%. And all of that is undoubtedly going to have an impact on the bottom line of your businesses. But it's also fair to say that those cost increases are also affecting the consumer. And those are our visitors. And you know, our visitors will see their disposable incomes decline in, in the year ahead. So in order for us to remain competitive, it's really important that we are continue to be perceived as a value for money destination, not a low cost destination, but a value for money destination. And cost management is going to be a really important part of that challenge. So it's great that we have Alex here with us today. Um, she's going to be exploring some of these issues with Sarah later on this morning. And um, I'm, I'm look, really looking forward to, to hearing that conversation. The pandemic has undoubtedly accelerated the need to embed sustainable and regenerative uh, approaches to tourism. And that's about bringing net benefits not just to the environment, but also to our communities. 
And I'm really pleased that we have probably got two of the most highly regarded experts in that area with us today, uh, in Professor Xavier Font and Tino O'Dwyer. And again, I look forward to hearing from them shortly. I suppose the one thing that everyone in the room is really acutely aware of is the fact that the like every sector, the tourism and hospitality industry is facing real challenges in terms of recruitment and uh, retention of staff. Um, and I suppose the combined and enduring sort of perception that you know, we are perhaps maybe not the most sort of attractive of industries is something that we really, really need, need to tackle head on. Um, and we're in, a, we're in an employer's, employee's market at the moment. We need to go out and sell ourselves to those people who we want to come uh, and work for us. And it's great that Paul Redmond is with us. Um, and Paul is going to talk about the focus on people and, and the future of work. And, and like the minister, I'm really delighted to see uh, a real great friend of Northern Ireland here in, in Johnny, uh, Johnny Cole Hamilton uh, from the RNA. And Johnny's going to be telling us a little bit about all of the preparatory work uh, that he is currently doing uh, to bring Port Rush, uh, or bring the Open back to Port Rush in 2025. And, and he's really busy because he's sitting looking out the window at the moment as he's watching the stands go up and the scoreboards go up for the Open, 150th Open at, uh, at um, St Andrews. So we're really delighted, Johnny, that you were able to spare us the time and, and come over. When we last did the Open here in 2019, that was the year that we broke the £1 billion tourism revenue target. Um, and I have no doubt that come 2025, we will have an Open Championship, which will be even bigger and better than the one we had uh, in, in 2019. And I have no doubt, again, that we will be able to breach that £1 billion um, expenditure uh, target. And I think that's a real useful target, I think, for us to set ourselves as an industry. And that will provide, you know, provide us with, I think, a growth trajectory to the end of the decade and, and beyond. So finally, towards the end of today's conference, you're going to hear from our chairman, uh, Terence Brannigan. Um, and I would like to thank Terence and the board. Uh, we have some other board members here today, because they have been absolutely superb, I have to say, in the support that they've given to me and to the senior management team and, indeed, every member of staff in Tourism NI over, over the last couple of years. They've given us clear direction. They've given us guidance in really difficult times for everybody. And I can assure you that they are fully vested in uh, the work that we do and the support that we can give to the industry and want to make sure that we can support the industry wherever we can. So that's it for me. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing from our really excellent uh, lineup of speakers today. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoy your day. So once again, thank you very much. Uh, to John. Okay, well, I've been joined now on stage by uh, Tina O'Dwyer. Uh, we'll also be shortly uh, joined by Professor Xavier Font. Um, we're going to have a whole session now on sustainability. And Tina, I'm just going to hand over to you for this, which is lovely. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, when you heard there, we're going to have a whole session on sustainability. Who got really excited about that? <laughs> Two people in the front, and they're also speaking. So, um, it's, it's, it's one of those topics, I guess, that um, people kind of think, oh gosh, talking about sustainability, I've been talking about this for about 10 or 12 years and I'm really used to eyes glazing over um, and I don't take it personally anymore. It's not the topic that excites people. I'm sure everyone's excited for the next guy on the agenda, not Xavier, but the guy who's talking about the open and the lady from the telly and all those sexy things that we like to talk about. But we're here for sustainability. I have 10 minutes, Xavier has 10 minutes and then we're going to be talking after that so we'll be, we'll be going fast. Even if you were one of the four people who put up their hands to say they're excited about sustainability, or interested about it, it probably comes with those feelings of feeling a bit confused, a little bit uncertain, a little bit nervous about what does this mean for the industry? Um, are we going to suffer from flight shaming? Is it going to cost me a fortune? Um, are my visitors going to start turning away? Are we going to be good enough? And it's one of those topics that it's shrouded in negative language and shrouded in negative mindset. And the industry is coming at it almost from, you know, under the covers um, as such, that fe the feeling of guilt that comes with it. So I'm going to ask you just for our 20 minutes slots to indulge us and to imagine that we're talking about the open <laughs> or something like that. But to think, to open up your mind that this is actually a really interesting, relevant topic that is going to lead to a USP for your industry. Imagine it's like you're welcoming sustainability in the front door with a big handshake and a big hug 
and you're looking forward to what it has to offer for you. Because one thing we know for sure is this topic is defining the industry right now and is going to for the next, the ne this generation and the next generation. And we may as well be willing and enthusiastic about it and we may as well be open and excited about it as to be uh, the other way. So um, my journey in sustainability started um, I'd say, yeah, 10 or 12 years ago. And at that time, just to, to go back to give a bit of context, I had, uh, in our family, we had three children in three years. And for those three years, I was at home full time with them, which was something I thought I wanted to do. And then it turned out to be much harder than I expected. And by the end of the three years, I was willing to pay somebody to bring me back to work. Um, at the same time, it was around 2009, 2010, the Celtic Tiger had crashed. We had a big Celtic Tiger house and mortgage and our business had failed as a result of the Celtic Tiger as well. And so we had to, had to go back to work. It wasn't, it wasn't a choice. And a job came up locally, which was a sustainable tourism coordinator for an ecotourism network in the Burn in County Clare. And being very honest, I did not know one thing about tourism or eco or sustainability or anything like that. It was local, it was flexible, it was near my house and I could work it around the kids and that's why I was interested. And that made me an absolute fraud in that space at the time. Uh, I had no doubt about it and I was full of imposter syndrome but actually it's, it's a position most people find themselves in right now where I don't know where to start, I don't know what to do and am I just an imposter here, am I just a fraud? And I'd say the first thing is you don't have to be you know, an eco-warrior to be eco-active. You don't even have to be eco educated at this point, um, but you do have to commit to getting started. So that was one of the things was I did want to do a good, good job and wanted to have impact and all the rest. And I'm sharing that because I mean, my journey in sustainability was about um, kind of decluttering all of this and trying to understand it from a point of zero and without any of the passion and the emotion that went with wanting to save the planet. It wasn't about the survival of the planet for me. It was about our own survival, quite simply. It really was. That's how much passion I brought to it. But it's, um, that's the journey we have to go on. It's not, what I want to share with you is the moments of clarity we had on that journey. Um, and it is pretty much about um, just, you know, breaking it down without, without all the emotion that tends to go with this particular topic. So that was the, the beginning. I suppose one of the first things I thought about, and I just share that, as I said, it felt like it was a fog. There was so much information, it was hard to know what was true, and every so often you'd get a point of clarity and feel quite clear, and then the fog would descend again, or the clouds would gather again, and you'd find what you were doing right was not right enough, and you needed to be doing something else. So I'll just share you through the kind of the way I categorise that. My job was to help tourism businesses uh, take sustainable action in ways that were tangible, palatable and actionable. So I was trying to figure this out so I could help others uh, do this. So why was tourism, why does tourism get such a rap on this? Because if you look at the science and the evidence, tourism is not the biggest offender. It's not the guiltiest of industries. There are other industries that have far more to do in terms of addressing this issue and can have more impact. And neither is this island the biggest offender. Neither are we the ones that will have the most impact anywhere. If, if the US and China did a lot, almost the whole problem would be solved, for example. Um, and lots of throwaway statements like that, everybody can refute, but just as, as context to that. So why is tourism um, in the spotlight? And what I discovered is it's not about the science, it's about our emotions, it's about how we feel about it, and it's about what our visitors think. And this is this just one that struck me that I saw at a conference, it's research from 2017, which came from, um, Wines and Nicholas, I think, personal choices to reduce your contribution to climate change. And it's hard to read, I realise this, but down here is changing your light bulb. That's number one. Right at the other end is having one less child, which is a bit late. And you can see where it's so... And everywhere in between is like, replace your typical car with a hybrid, hybrid car, eat a plant-based diet. But if you look at this one in particular, avoid one round-trip transatlantic flight. That's what that is. So if you're looking at your personal choices, um, this is one where you can have a big impact relative to everything else. I can change every light bulb, I can drive around or give up my car altogether, but I can take one less flight and have so much impact. And that makes it, irrespective of every kind of global statistic and what we can do, this makes it really personal to the tourism industry. It becomes discretionary. And what that taught me is we're going to have to be very, very special to justify a flight. And not just a flight, even a drive even a drive from Cork to Belfast, because that's where it's going. So how do you become very, very special? That transferred it for me, that it was about, you can do less harm, but really it's about doing more good for tourism. So then we were trying to isolate, what could the businesses in the Burren do? What can you actually do? And this was a way of clearing the fog as well. It's a huge topic all the time. 
but you, there's only so much you can do. It has to chunk down to what's possible for this industry. So there's a whole lot of things that international bodies, governments, local authorities, other industries have to look after. What is it that tourism can look after and what is it that the DMOs can support enterprises with? So if you look at the tourism enterprises, we can certainly do something about your individual carbon footprint. Then things about building the resilience, the long-term resilience of your business, supporting natural and cultural heritage and protecting it, employment, which was mentioned, engagement with visitors, and also caring for your community. And if you were to chunk those down, I'd put all these five into community and the other into carbon. Again, doing less harm, which is carbon, but doing more good, which is all the other ones as well. So tourism as an industry has enormous potential to do more good. If you look... I don't know what that was. If, <laughs> if you look at... Um, if you look at them, five of those areas we mentioned are about positive, doing something better. Um, and that kind of crystallized for me where the focus had to be. I chunked it down into three things then. Sorry, I'm messing with my slides. The power of three is good for us all to remember. And to categorize what we could do on, those, on those, uh, that purple slide there was leaner and greener, better and brighter, and louder and prouder. And I'm going to talk through what I mean by those. Leaner and greener, definitely carbon. If you're going to be involved in sustainability, it is about climate action. It was mentioned this morning um, by the minister uh, that you're, we're all on a journey to having our carbon emissions by 2030 and net zero by 2050, if you know what that means. So that means reducing your costs in carbon through managing your wastewater and energy. As an industry, this absolutely has to be addressed. Now, what I including transport. And when I mean transport, I mean the transport related to your business, not the international aviation, because one of the important things is addressing aviation, unless the world decides not to fly, which doesn't seem likely, addressing aviation is the job of the aviation industry, the fuel, and there's loads of people working on that. The tourism industry has to work with the outcomes of that. Um, so looking particularly at your own uh, carbon, carbon footprint is important. I'm not going to go through how you do that, but it is about measurement and monitoring, and people say, well, how can I reduce my energy if the industry is going to grow? One of the key things to take away is it's energy per visitor or energy per meter, or a, bench, a square meter, a, a benchmark that you can manage over time, whether you're in, whether you're, and compare over time whether your visitor numbers are going up and down. If you want to know where to start, energy is the place to start, and after that, food waste. If you haven't already addressed those things, that's where to go. And if imagine, I'm being very simplistic, if you know how much energy you use right now and where it's coming from, imagine you set yourself a target to reduce it by 50% by 2030 because that's what everybody else is doing. So if you use X amount right now, how can you get it down by 50%? And there are ways, and one of the biggest myths is that they will cost you a lot of money. The truth is that on energy, waste, and water, they will save you money. It's a question of over what amount of time it will pay back to you. There are some that are, will be spent that doesn't necessarily pay back, but that's in, if you've, there's like 90% of the actions up until that point will pay back to you in financial terms. So there is a myth around that side of things. The thing about leaner and greener, like I said, it will save you money, it will reduce your carbon footprint, so it's a win-win. It is a no-brainer. There is a question why people don't do it, but one of the important things is that, um, is, is that um, nobody will thank you for doing this, because everybody's having to do it. On your holidays and on your business conferences, you don't want to be talking about these things particularly. You want to be talking about something better. Our visitors want to be empowered to do more good, not to do less harm. And that's where Better and Brighter comes in. Leaner and greener won't distinguish our industry because every industry is doing that and every household is doing that, every single inch. So it's not a distinguisher. What is a distinguisher is where we can be better and brighter. Our visitors want us to help them to do more good. And there's a few ways to do that. Your contribution to community, and I, there, I'm going to put five things here and I'm sure businesses in this room are doing a lot on this already, but not maybe quantifying it. I'm going to say contribution to your community and the, place you, the role you play in your community, protection and, um, and interpretation of our natural and cultural heritage, employment, careers, accessibility, unlocking the place for as many people as possible, and biodiversity. All of those areas are things where we can bring more benefit and help our visitors to do the same, and our visitors will thank us for that. Unfortunately, sustainability is not enough anymore, or fortunately, it's been mentioned here about regenerative travel. This is a headline from 2020, move over sustainable travel, regenerative travel is here. And what is that in particular? If sustainable tourism, which aims to counterbalance the social and environmental impacts associated with travel, was the aspirational outer limit of ecotourism, the new frontier is regenerative travel, or leaving a place better than you found it. 
So we have doing less harm, doing more good, and then leaving the place better than you found it. Sustainability is about slowing down the degradation. Regeneration is about restoring and regenerating the cap capability to live in a new way. And that's what Embrace the Giant Spirit is about. And I think it's been mentioned by the Minister and by uh, John McGrillan as well, that regeneration is where uh, Northern Ireland's tourism is going to go. And within that brand, it's absolutely built in that it is, it's a, it's a rare brand in the sense that it is about the spirit of your place, about sharing it, about unlocking it, about opening up to the visitor, and about making sure the place is benefiting from tourism. And if that's the, 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 the direction of travel, then that's, you're in exactly the right spot. I'm going to move through these because I'm particularly out of time. If we look at getting back to 2019 levels, and this is just any, any, any sight on that, that's the opposite of regeneration. That's growth for the, for the numbers sake, with the hope that regeneration will come from it. But we know that continuous growth leads to this eventually over time. Not here necessarily, but around the world. We started to see the beginnings of it at the Cliffs of Moher. We started to see it at the Giants Causeway in 2019. Going back to 2019 levels and beyond is going to lead to the things that tourism got a bad name for, which wasn't carbon, it was impact on community and impact on places. So this is a model that we, I, came up, I came up with to help me, again, communicate this to other people. If we want those impacts, if we, if we want the positive impacts, how do, shouldn't we set them as the targets rather than hope they come as a result of growth? So what we want is the Super Six. We want collaboration in the industry. We want communities to flourish, visitors to be empowered, thriving places, resilient businesses, and climate action. And we need all of those things at once. So it's not an upward linear line, it's a circular line feeding into each other. And it's just a way of thinking about regeneration that's actually a, a bit... I have loads on that if you want to send me an email, if you want to know more, there's my email address, you can send it to me. Once you have looked at your carbon, doing less harm, doing more good, and how you can make the world a better place, that's that's in a nutshell, I suppose, what we're looking at. Then you can start talking about marketing. And the industry is so much positive to talk about. And that's why I go with uh, louder and prouder, communicating this to the market. And there is an expert in the room on that. That's uh, Professor Xavier Fon. So I'm going to hand over to you on that, to how we, can, how we can bring more in the marketing side of things. Thank you. Let's try again. Okay. So I've got my 10 minute timer because otherwise we're going to run out of time here. What a beautiful room. Isn't it lovely to be together again? Let's just assume for a second that you're not here at the tourism conference. Let's assume that this is somebody's wedding. Let's say it's Tina's wedding. And in a second, she's going to come up the aisle and she's going to meet her groom here at the front, and the groom will have to say his vows. Let's imagine the single most creative thing the groom can think is, dear Tina, I'll be a good husband whenever possible. <laughs> what do you think? 50-50? Your tourism industry is saying, I am sustainable whenever possible. You know, and when is it not possible? Well, it's all right, because I said, I'll try. You can do better than that, right? We can have a little bit more conviction. There are five ways, at least, in which we can do better than that. First is, there is a lot of science now around behavioral techniques, working with psychologists to help nudge people. If you want your customers to help you reduce your operating costs, be a bit smarter about it. So to start with, ask nicely. Put some effort into it. Think about how you're asking. What, what is it you're actually asking? Because if you say to your customer, be greener, all you're saying is you're doing it wrong, but you're not telling them how to do it right. Now, when I say this to my kids, they have to listen because I pay the bills. But when you say to your customer, they don't have to listen. They just say, bugger off, I'll go somewhere else. Okay? Be trustworthy. If you give me a message that says, save the planet, reuse your towels, they know you're just doing it to save money. There's no way they're going to trust you. So you'll have to change your message and be much more honest about it. I've seen hotels that say, reusing towels saves me money. Every five towels you reuse, I'll invest that money to plant a tree. You're honest and you're doing something with it, so you're being transparent. So be honest, tell me what's going on. 
okay? Be humorous, although humor is a double-edged sword, okay? I saw this message at some point and I loved it. No smoking, it makes your breath smell and your teeth go horrid, as well as being a danger to the creatures that live in our forest. And I could see children in that tourist attraction going to their parents saying, eh, are you, you know, you know you, your, your teeth yellow and horrid, does your breath smell? Every parent knows the best police of parents' behavior is their kids, right? So speak to the kids, not to the parents. And be engaging. Tell us, tell us really what's happening. With these devices, for example, we, we've started installing devices in showers. We've done tests with about 50,000 hotel showers now, where we install these devices that tells you how long somebody has been in the shower. And it tells you while you're having your shower. We've managed to reduce length of showers by 20%. In a hotel, typically, this means a saving of 90 pounds per year per shower as a result of installing this. Okay. We're doing some work now with L'Oreal to change the chemical composition of shampoos and conditioners so you can have shorter showers but still enjoy just as much. There's a lot of work that's going on in sustainability to help your customers, help you make changes. There's a lot of work to also help companies, and particularly it's large companies that are doing this, to actually attract more customers. Some of my work is with Expedia, Booking.com, Google, and we're looking at things like this. This screenshot you've got here comes from Google Flights, from Natbot, since last year already, since before the COP in Glasgow. Whenever you look for a flight, it tells you not only the locations and the price, but the carbon emissions. And together with the carbon emissions, it tells you whether these are above or below the average. And now I'm working with Google to find out whether, by introducing this, it has changed consumer behavior in any way. If you haven't done so already, if you're an accommodation business, and you're selling through Booking, Booking has offered you already the possibility to introduce sustainable information about your property. And Booking, one thing they're really good at is maximizing the chances that they will be able to sell what they want to sell. So we've done a lot of experiments to look at how do we best communicate sustainability in the booking platform for the properties that have got something to say. So you probably are working with green tourism right now to help you reduce your operating costs and learn how to be green. But one thing we know is that green tourism is not particularly good at marketing. And I'm happy to say that, and Andrea who runs it knows that I agree with her on that. But use the lessons you've learned to then introduce that information in booking. And in the next few weeks, Expedia will do the same. I'm, I'm giving them training on this next week, okay? And Google Hotels is going to start doing the same, okay? So every hotel can introduce that information and that is for free. The other thing is green procurement practices, and I know this has the European Commission you know, logo, but this is happening everywhere. The public sector is having to introduce sustainability criteria as part of their purchasing guidelines. So you're going to be asked to do these things, whether you like it or not, and if you don't do it, it's okay, your competitors will do it for you, and then you'll be kind of one step behind. Find ways of communicating sustainability to improve satisfaction. So, do it as a way that you make customers feel good. I think this comes from the Hastings hotels here in, in Belfast, okay? You know, have, have a booklet that basically says, and who made my breakfast today? And highlight some of your suppliers. Storytelling is so, so powerful, okay? Or find a ways of using fun and appealing language. Find ways that you can tell something to somebody that makes them feel like they're doing the right thing. Customers don't want to be told what you're doing is unsustainable, you should change. Very often, you can improve customer satisfaction by simply telling them you are consuming a sustainable product and helping them taste the difference. Help your customers use their five senses to experience the sustainable value of what they're doing. And there's many ways in which you can do this, but I've got three minutes left, so I'll have to go really fast. But let me just give you one example here. This comes from a hotel where they're doing industrial composting from everything that comes from their kitchen. Now, their website used to say, we're really proud we reduce our waste going to landfill by 10 tons per year, and now we're treating it in our garden. And I thought, oh God. You can imagine straight away, people think the garden's going to be a dump. Okay, we changed the message and then we said our flowers in our garden look much nicer essentially than anybody else's. They say better than this. Okay, but we have a beautiful garden with really kind of luscious, you know, plants. The secret, 10 tons of compost. Now, everybody's interested in the flowers looking good. And the people who know something about sustainability will understand where the compost came from. So... 
Tell me the customer benefit. Don't tell me what you had to do to achieve it. You've got plenty of opportunities to convince your customers. You can tell the customer of your sustainability action once they're on site, but to attract the customer to come in the first place, you have to always, always, always focus on the customer benefit. And at the moment, very often, you're not doing that. I'll save the other examples for another day. You're probably wondering why there's a sheep there at the top right-hand side. I'll, we'll save that for Q&A, okay? Um, fourth, and then there's a fifth example, two minutes to go. Increase customer expenditure. One of the key issues that Northern Ireland needs to work on is increasing length of stay, okay? And increasing repeat visitation. Linked to that is increasing customer expenditure. So, very often, one of the examples I really like about this is the National Trust's 50 things to do before you're 11 and three quarters. And please, please, please steal it, okay? Adapt this to your own destination. Adapt it by saying, look, if you want to discover Northern Ireland, there are 50 things you need to do, or creating a bucket list of interesting things to do. But also, if you look at the activities you've got in there, I don't know how clear the image is for you. We've got things like, you know, um, roll down a really big hill, camp outdoors, build a den, skim a stone. And you'll say, what's the carbon footprint of that? Zero. And actually, for many parents who are really struggling financially right now, what's the cost of that? Also zero. Now, sometimes I know you want customer expenditure through visitor attractions, but also the, the, the lion size of the expenditure of tourism is accommodation and food and transport. And not that the transport really doesn't help you. That, you know, so, so most of the money that you really want them to spend on is more food, increased length of stay, increased accommodation. So give them activities to do that are free or almost free that will allow the family to say, I can earmark my budget for something else and I can make this a slightly longer holiday. Okay? And, and it's beautiful, actually, what they managed to do with this campaign because, you know, once you do 10 of those things and you go to a National Trust property and you tell them, I did the first 10 things, they give you the most important thing in the world for a six-year-old, a sticker that says, I'm an explorer, wow. And then you do another 10, and they give you another sticker. I, I showed this to a business uh, back in Spain, where I'm originally from, and he adapted it, and he basically created a campaign for his eco-lodge. And he said to the families that were coming there, if you do all 50, oh, oh dear, that's my 10 minutes. I'll have one more minute, okay? If you do all 50, we'll give you a weekend for free in our yurts, or our, you know, in spring or in autumn. And I said, wow. David, that's really generous. And he said, well, to get a family to do all 50, they typically come six or seven times. And they bring friends. And they are our best ambassadors ever on Instagram. Plus, he said, frankly, the kind of people that want to do these things are the customers I like having. And I am sure every single one of you sometime would have paid money so one of your customers would have never, ever come to your business. <laughs> Right? So sometimes it's not about more customers, sometimes it's about attracting the kind of customers that you really like and that make you think, I would like to be in this sector, I'd like to generally be a host or a hostess. Last example and then I'm going. How do we increase brand loyalty and reduce seasonality? I could spend some time here, but I'm just going to give you one last example from a lady called Mary who has a small um, ac accommodation business in Lancashire in the north of England. Okay, Mary's over 80. I didn't ask her her age, but trust me, she is. And Mary said to me, in my property, there is no mobile phone reception. So if somebody wants to call, you know, book with me, they have to phone me. I don't know how to use a computer. I'm not going to start now. And I said to Mary, okay, Mary, what, what do you like doing? He says, well, with the customers I like, not everybody, I take them outdoors and I show them how to identify flowers and I help them press those flowers. And after pressing the flowers, you know what it's like if you press flowers when you were kids, right? You need to leave them there pressed for several months. So Mary says to those kids, here's a postcard, draw me something. Here's an envelope, write me your address. The week before Christmas, Mary gets the flowers your children pressed, puts them inside the postcard that they drew, inside the envelope with a Mary, you know, happy Christmas card, that says, Merry Christmas from me. If you book by the 15th of January, you got 15% discount. Mary told me she knew nothing about marketing. Wow. 
okay, she was spot on because the single most visible Christmas card on the mantelpiece this year is going to be that one. Okay, and that one doesn't go here. This is not, you know, a, a mailing campaign. This one goes directly here, right? This one, there's no filter for this. And I said to Mary, are you getting larger bookings? How do you know that? God, now you're getting the grandparents, the uncles, the whole family wants to come back because you're selling nostalgia. Now, none of the examples I've mentioned, particularly not Mary, nobody used the S word. You don't have to say, I am a sustainable business to sell sustainability. You just have to do it. Thank you very much. I think we're sitting down for a few minutes, oh, are we? Yeah. yeah. Um, that was fascinating for, from both of you. I mean, really, just to introduce as well, um, Tina is the founder and MD of the tourism space, and we saw quickly on the slide at the beginning there, uh, Xavier is a professor of sustainability marketing at the School of Hospitality, Tourism and Management at the University of Surrey. Let's take um, some questions now very, very quickly, because we are going to have a panel at the end. Have you, have you something else to... Yeah, that yeah. works. Go. Okay. Anybody wants to? The sheep. The sheep. <laughs> um, essentially, with the sheep, it was from another hotel where they basically said, um, you know, we respond to customer complaints. We had complaints in the past that the room was cold and therefore we've insulated our roofs. And I thought, what's going on? This is not going to be a great stay for me. And when I went to reception, they told me, well, we insulated the roof with sheep's wool. And so I went and changed the message, and the message now says, um, my 300 sheep gave up their winter woolly coat to keep you warm at night, sleep tight. <laughs> Which, frankly, I think works a lot better. I mean, I'm not a poet, you know, but I think we could do something with that that actually gives you something more exciting. Brilliant. Okay, any other uh, questions at this point? I love Mary's story as well. I love the fact that it, it talks to the, to the heart. That's what makes people come back. But your giant spirit campaign is really a great platform for doing this, right? I mean, that's why I just thought it was so clever, you know, the, the, the slogan that you've got there. But again, when you talk about sustainability and you've talked to auditors for so long, you know, like people like yourself that will go and give them advice, I just worry that then the business think they need to talk to customers just like they talk to the environmental police. Yeah. You know, like customers don't want to do that. Customers are interested in what's in it for me, right? Yeah. I think, yeah, it's related to that question of language, what, what some of your examples there, it's translating how you say it into something that's palatable. And I think when you're coming at it from the idea of, oh, we have to talk about this or we have to prove it, you can't actually get to that level of language. And that's why the mindset really is, is the trigger at the beginning. How, how you, it's like the question, you know, think about this as an invitation, think about this as, as a friend as such, and then you open up a whole new, new way of speaking about it, like those examples there. I agree with you about Embrace a Giant Spirit. Um, if you look into the brand and the narrative, the language, the, the way it expresses what Northern Ireland is and the way it extends an invitation and why it does that, which is in the brand, it's like a regenerative brand that was written. If you'd said, write me a regenerative brand or create it, this would be it. And uh, the platform is, is immense, you know, is immense really for this moment in time. Mm. Do, do not expect a single customer will come and knock on your door and say, I want to stay here because you have a green logo. That's, that's just not happening. I wanted to ask you, because you mentioned it there, when you showed the booking.com stats and the, you know, you said there's, an, um, we've chatted about this, there's, there's little evidence that customers act on that. Is that still the case? That it's... That is still the case, sadly, and this is why I love doing the experiments with booking.com and companies that size, because they're really good at experimenting and doing A-B testing. Yeah. And we're now looking at ways in which we can work on that, and also what incentives will we give to customers to get them to book the greener properties. Mm. So, so booking.com, amongst other companies, have realized that for them to reduce their own carbon footprint, they need to help the suppliers they're selling to reduce their carbon footprint. Mm. And, and nowadays, you know, the, the, the challenge is we've done everything we can do at the head office. We now need to help our suppliers do the same. Yeah. Okay. 
So, so they will go the extra mile to find a way of doing this. Now, I know every single one of you will have had mixed experiences with TripAdvisor, Booking.com, any distribution channel. I'm not saying they're the good guys. I'm just saying you can't not work with them nowadays. So you might as well find a way of you know, getting them to help you. Yeah, and I think the point you made about green tourism and certification in general, it's a really important point. They're not marketers. That's not their job. They're certifiers and they're trainers and they're standards organizations. And I think people assume once I have that, that'll do the marketing. And actually, it's, uh, I, I love your presentation because it's so, um, we have to trust our own intuition on the rest of it. You know, you have to be back to your human level. And I think when you see, hopefully, the topics I was putting up there are the things that Xavier was, was saying. Loads of businesses do this all the time, but they're not considering it sustainability and they're not considering it as something strong enough to talk about. And um, the whole process of, of creating the Embrace a Giant Spirit experiences here is bringing out all that emotional stuff that speaks to our heart, which is what our visitors, what our visitors want. Yeah. Uh, think, think of it this way. I know you're probably going to say, when customers go online, they don't look for sustainable accommodation. Right? They don't. Okay, put it this way. Let's imagine for a second you're dating and you're going to match.com. How many of you in match.com are going to say, I'd like a boyfriend who brushes his teeth? <laughs> you, don't, you don't search for that. How many of you are going to stop dating somebody like this if they don't? How many of you search for a restaurant last time you went on a date and you said, oh, I'd like to go to a restaurant that has clean toilets? Right? But again, if you go to a toilet and they're not clean, you're certainly not coming back. Sustainability now is becoming this. In many cases, particularly for business travel, you can't not do it anymore. It's a given. It's a challenge, though, isn't it? That that's a given, but it takes quite a lot of work to become green on the, you know, to brush your teeth and to, to have all the sustainable stuff in place. But it's a real challenge for business. I, I'm interested in your perspective. How do you, you put in all that work and it ends up just being a hygiene factor, just something that you expected. And actually, the marketing is, is in all the other stuff. But it's only a hygiene factor because we've chosen to work on water, waste, and energy. Yes. And we've left yeah. it at that. Yeah. And if we actually turn it around and say, actually, isn't sustainability about creating meaningful, authentic experiences that tell me I could have not had this experience anywhere other than Northern Ireland? Yeah. You know, what, what makes Northern Ireland the really gorgeous place that it is? And how do you find a way of creating this experience and communicating it before people come and while they're here and when they go home? One thing we tend to assume is that marketing something happens for first-time visitors before they come. Actually, you know, marketing is something you're doing all the time, right? But if you only put the effort on attracting first-time visitors, well, this is never going to work. Yeah, I do. I agree. Limiting it to, to water, waste and energy and all of that carbon which is massively important, but it is the crusade the whole world is on. It's not specific to tourism. And it limits our thinking and the potential of what we'll do if that's what we define sustainability as. And I, yeah, I agree. It's just, it's transformation potential is way beyond the limits of, of the carbon discussion. Yeah, absolutely. That is super. I well, think um, you're going to wrap up talking now. about yep. um, girls looking for fellas all the time. <laughs> Yeah. I'm wondering what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> Girls looking for fellas brushing their teeth and weddings and all sorts. It's been yeah, an absolute sorry. pleasure. I mean, I, I've learned over the years that the, the more daft the example, the more you remember it. Okay. So just, just take that away from today. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much. We're going to have you back. We'll see you later again. Thank you, thank to you. Tina, and thank you to Xavier. Very good. Thank you. And of course, as we've heard already, all eyes on Port Rush uh, as we await the return of the Open in 2025, three years on from the last one, three years to go. So what's happening? We are delighted to have uh, one of our speakers here today, Johnny Cole Hamilton, Championship Executive Director for the R&A. Johnny, over to you. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be back in Northern Ireland. Uh, over the last 10 years before the Open in 2019, it was becoming my home from home. Um, I love this part of the world. My wife kept commenting that I was using the word grand a lot more than I used to. Uh, 
my accent from St Andrews was blending into an Antrim coast accent. So, but it is great to be back in uh, Northern Ireland and we can't wait to come back to the Antrim coast in a little over three years from now. I do understand, though, that not everybody in the room, I never take for granted that everybody understands completely what the Open Championship is. So for the benefit of any non-sport fans in the room, it is golf's original championship. It's been played since 1860, and for one week of the year, the pursuit of the famous Claret Jug Trophy is the focus of the sporting world. The Open, as we know, was last year in 2019, and I believe it's the biggest sporting event that's ever been staged in Northern Ireland. What I want to try and talk to you all about today is three things that I hope will lead to a better understanding of the Open, and hopefully will be helpful to you and your own businesses and the tourism economy. Firstly, what is special about Port Rush? I'm sure all of you will be able to answer that. Next, what does the Open deliver for its key stakeholders, including the host economy of Northern Ireland? And lastly, what does the future hold for this particular major event? We've always known that Port Rush is special from the Championship first outing here in 1951. It was special before that, but from a golfing perspective, 1951 was perhaps its big moment. The Open Golf Championship, fought out at Royal Portrush, County Antrim, ended in a British win. Max Faulkner, 34-year-old unattached professional, was unperturbed by the weather or the strong competition he was up against. It's reported that he'd backed himself to win, and win he certainly did, with an aggregate of 285. Here's his last putt. Two strokes better than Serda of Argentina, Faulkner's was a fine performance, well worthy of trophy and congratulations. He's quite a character, Max Faulkner. Uh, he had a six-shot lead uh, going into the final day of the championship, and he began signing autographs, Max Faulkner, Open Champion 1951. Now, that takes some gall. Uh, but he remained unflappable, and his winning margin was reduced to just two shots on that final green, but he did win. Um, we re revisit uh, all of our open venues on a relatively regular cycle. Um, and of course, we do go to venues where we have no experience. So my team, none of us were around in 1951. I mean, I'm 52 and I'm the oldest in my team. Uh, so none of us were there. We were working from a blank canvas, but we now have the experience of being there uh, and we can't wait to come back. Why Port Rush? The sea is a feature of every Lynx golf course and the Open is only hosted on Lynx golf courses. The Lynx is defined as the low value strip of real estate that connects the seashore and the land better suited for agricultural and other uses. It is our very good fortune that this Lynx land at Royal Port Rush is absolutely perfect for playing golf. The best players in the world want to face the true test of Lynx golf. It's a very difficult examination. It's set by nature and the field of play is exposed without mercy to the elements. Seaside towns offer the basic infrastructure that visitors to the championship require and we, on a temporary basis, provide the rest. We need good transport links. We need accommodation. There is never, ever enough of it. And the other key components that make up the nighttime economy. You've just seen what it looked like in 1951, and now just very quickly, what it looked like in 2019. It's quite a contrast. A very special day in the sporting calendar brings us to this stunning part of the world. As the Open returns to Northern Ireland and Royal Port Rush for the first time in 68 years. It's been a long, long wait for the Open to return to Royal Port Rush. It has been an absolute delight. I don't think it will be anything like 68 years before we're back here again.
have to say it was a great honour and privilege. I've, I've been lucky enough to be involved in 24 Open Championships and to be in the heart in the middle of that atmosphere and what Shane did for the Open Championship and what Port Rush did for the Open Championship was a great honour and privilege to be in amongst it. But what does the Open deliver? Our prime directive is to deliver the best player, the best fan and the best television experience in major championship golf. We've never expected to try and do that in the middle of a global pandemic. None of us have. I think everybody in this room today was engaged in some, has been engaged in some form of COVID fight back, particularly for the tourism economy. For us, it was critical to take an early lead in working with the government for the safe return of major events to a full capacity attendance. And the 149th Open last year in Kent, which was originally scheduled for 2020, it was the first Open we had to cancel since the Second World War. We staged it a year late, but we staged it under the UK's event research programme, and we capped those numbers at 123 people, 123,000 people, sorry, <laughs> which was quite an achievement in a pandemic. The Women's Open, the AIG Women's Open in 2020, we staged that behind closed doors and it was the only major women's event in the UK that year. And in 2021, we capped that at 32,000 uh, people under the Scottish Government's Gateway Programme. The 150th Open at St Andrews, with the pandemic hopefully going into the rearview mirror, we have had 1.3 million ticket applications and sold out our attendance at 290,000 in the first ever ballot. So if anyone's asking you, is there a pent up demand to come and watch live sport or live events, there certainly is. And we're seeing it firsthand and we will see it over the next few years. We also must deliver for our players though. For our spectators, getting a great view of the action is vital for our fans and it's keeping the championship moving along at a pace. At Port Rush, we had an attendance of 237,750, and we had to build a lot of infrastructure and temporary infrastructure. That tunnel you can see there, we built under a sand dune. And uh, when I took some st staff from Tourism Northern Ireland, when we had it covered up and asked them to guess where it was, I'd give them a tenner if they could point it out to me. None of them knew we were standing on top of it. So we did a great job of building that tunnel, but also making sure it stayed consistent with the landscape. We have a fiber optic spine that goes through the entire golf course, which delivers all of our TV, TV pictures and our data. That's about 20 miles long. Um, we had a double deck player clubhouse, which for the first time um, we brought everything the players needed into a double tier structure that we built and we designed. And to say it went down well would be an understatement. And for those of you that follow golf, this is what Ian Poulter thought of it. Done. One of our player lounges, of the many we have. And I just want to say to the Open Championship, this is by far by far the best facilities we've ever had. The locker room is immense. The lounges are incredible. The gym facilities are perfect. The ticket collection is perfect. Uh, so to the whole organization of the Open Championship, if this is your new standard, then everyone who plays an Open Championship from now on, you are very, very fortunate. This is the perfect setup I've seen for player hospitality and guests that we've had today. Well done. And for those of you that know Ian Poulter, he's, he can deliver bad news as well, pretty good. Uh, so for him to be so positive is a really strong thing. So we are delivering for players, but we must deliver for fans as well. The fans who come deserve the best experience we can provide. 
They need the best viewing options on natural mountings, on raised platforms and on free grandstand seats. The open app helps them find their way around the golf course. The free Wi-Fi that we provide around the entire 400 acres of the venue assists in giving them all the information they need. We've got to make sure we have a diverse audience and a younger audience. We have been letting under 16s into the Open Championship free of charge since as far back as 2004. We provide free accommodation in camping villages for under 25s who are coming to the Championship. And that open camping village is a very popular accommodation option and it's becoming a real heartbeat of the Championship. Almost 40% of those staying at the campsite are under that age group uh, and we have around 8,000 free bed spaces in that facility. So hopefully we are delivering for fans, but we also have to deliver to our TV audience as well. So we delivered award-winning World Feed BAFTA winning coverage actually of the Open uh, and at Port Rush we did that to 59 countries with an audience of 100 million people. We were commanding resources three times greater than it was deployed at the 2018 FIFA World Cup final. The World Feed kit list is pretty impressive. 59 cabled and 11 wireless cameras, two super slow motion cameras, two jimmy jibs, eight top tracers, two fairway top tracers, eight bunker cams, one wire cam, blah, blah, blah. I could go on and on and on. It's a pretty big setup, but very, very important. That guarantees that every approach shot to the green and every putt is captured for every player and meaning shots that make history are never missed. We also deliver an economic benefit which is hugely important and it's been touched on this morning. The total economic benefit in excess of 100 million and 219. We are predicting 200 million in St Andrews this year. The total economic impact of 45 million for Northern Ireland and a 13.5 million in gross value added. A really good stat that I discovered the other day is new industry research into the value of golf into the UK economy has highlighted that the Open at Royal Port Rush in just eight days accounted for 1.1% of the entire growth of the Northern Ireland economy in 2019. And I think that's a really important context for us to, as part of our partnership to, between the Open and this great, uh, great island of Ireland. We also have to add in, of course, the destination marketing benefit of 61 million, which comes from the global television and other media. And of course, oh, sorry, and of course, the 20, we also had 26.2 million of new money entering the local economy of Cos Causeway Coast and Glens. So this is all extremely important as well. I have always believed the Open Championship to be a partnership. It's not the RNA, yes, we are the right holders for it, but we cannot do it on our own. We have to do it with lots of other partners. We, could, we absolutely could not have delivered what we did in 2019 without the wholehearted support of Royal Portrush Golf Club the local authority, the executive, the civil service, TNI, PSNI, and all the other partners, and of course your good selves, who supported the whole process with such enthusiasm and passion. We were also active in the consultation with the Department of Communities, and we still are, around the new licensing laws for major events, and we're very pleased to see the new major events orders uh, take legal force last month. I think that will be transformational for the Open Championship and hopefully for everyone in the room. What does the future hold? Looking to 25 and beyond, we are contracted and delighted to be committed as well to having a further Open Championship uh, beyond that, agreed with the Northern Ireland Executive and TNI. Um, but we also need to keep momentum going with the venue. We need to keep developing. We will look again at the test, the exam that we have set the players and working with the golf, golf club we will make sure that all the changes we made are well embedded and that we have a studied review of what we need to do to take that forward. 
We also want to build on that 237,000 people. We think we can move towards 250,000 and give them the best experience. We may need to make sure we provide the right infrastructure. And we always want to do this working in conjunction with the golf club. <clears throat> Innovation, I know, is a theme of this championship, of this conference, and we are looking to innovate all the time. Some of the things we are looking at, 3D course modelling, that really helps us reduce our requirement for repeated pre-event site visits. And taking Tina's advice, we will certainly cut down on our flights uh, coming over the Irish Sea um, because we will be able to do a lot of the 3D course modelling back in St Andrews. We also have remote television production. We are working with our TV partners all the time. At the moment, we need 1,500 broadcast staff on site, and we can significantly reduce this with remote television production. But importantly, we can still deliver best-in-class television coverage for a global audience of that 100 million. We're looking at blockchain ticketing technology, which helps us, as an organizer, keep track of tickets after they are sold. All the tickets are securely linked to the purchaser and tickets can be then resold but only at fair prices. E-commerce, that's growing all the time for us and we expect 40% of our merchandise by the time we come back to Royal Port Rush to be sold in that way. And digital marketing will command about 70% of our advertising and marketing budgets by that time. Web3 in the metaverse, these are words when I joined the RNA I never thought I'd be talking about. But virtual reality is coming, ladies and gentlemen, and people are going to start engaging with the open and engaging with golf with virtual reality headsets, and we want to be at the forefront of it. Now, my, my children find this very amusing that I actually took this picture. Uh, for those of you that know St Andrews, I was having drinks at the top of Hamilton Hall, uh, and it was a lovely evening, and I just casually took that picture with my iPhone, um, and then I don't post on LinkedIn very often. I keep being told by my marketing team that I should, but I don't. Um, anyway, for whatever reason, I posted this, and it got 150,000 views, uh, 3,000 likes, 20-odd shares. My kids think I'm an influencer now. <laughs> uh, I normally get two likes, and I made it quite clear to the kids that they could have posted it and got 150,000 views because the star of the show, as ever, is the home of golf. But the star of the show in 2025 will be Royal Port Rush on the Antrim coast. I just um, want to, I think it's really important as well, given the great talk we had from the two previous speakers on sustainability, I would like to reassure Tina that the RNA absolutely do not glaze over at sustainability. Uh, we take it extremely seriously. We understand the platform we have, the leverage that we have, and it's absolutely critical to us that we do everything we do in a sustainable way. We launched our GreenLink strategy in 2016. We, Port Rush was the first time that we eradicated single-use plastic and at the championship, and we did our water project. Um, clearly, this is a that's Niall Horan who supports uh, supports us in that, and uh, it's been hugely successful. But we do a lot more. Sorry, I'm talking away to a slide without. Uh, well, that's our water project. But we also introduced our Mercedes-Benz courtesy car fleet of electric vehicles. And we charge, the, charge them from a solar power, solar power. We are using hydro-treated vegetable oil. We use something like 200,000 litres of hydro-treated vegetable oil at the Open Championship last year. We separate all of our recycling. We have been sending zero waste to landfill. Our TV compounds and our contractor compounds are all solar powered. We use local sustainable produce from suppliers. There's much more we can do and we're going to continue doing it, but we understand our responsibility in this area and 
we are going to continue doing that. We also, importantly, want to leave behind a good message. Lots of people are not, I've always understood this and my colleagues always understood this, not everybody loves the open, not everybody locally loves the open. To some, it's a complete pain in the backside. And we need to make sure, it's no good running around saying to somebody who's been severely inconvenienced in their hometown that there was an impact of 100 million pounds economically because they can't see it, they can't touch it. So we want to sustain that goodwill that we receive from the local community. And that's why we leave a legacy fund of around £100,000 and we work with the local authority about how we might use that in a better way and do something that they can absolutely touch. One of the most successful things we did when we left Port Rush is we put up a huge vinyl on the side of a building and said, thank you, Royal Port Rush, for your support. And we left it on the side there and it absolutely went viral on Twitter and uh, Instagram and things. The local community is so important. Not that I'm counting, but I looked at my watch just before I got up, and I think we have 61 days, 19 hours, and about 35 minutes until the first tee shot at the 150th Open at St Andrews. The golfing world, certainly, and hopefully beyond that, is waiting to deliver this landmark event for our sport. The bar has been raised, and the return to Royal Port Rush in just three years' time on the 13th to 20th July will be keenly anticipated not just by sports fans in the island of Ireland and Northern Ireland, but around the world. It's been a real triumphant decade for Northern Ireland in golf. The success of Irish golfers in general, in the, at the Open in particular, has heightened that sense of anticipation. It was a key driver to returning to Port Rush. At Port Rush in 2025, Darren Clark, our 2011 Open champion, will be 57. Rory McIlroy, our champion in 2014, will be 36. And 2019's champion Shane Lowry will be 38. All of them still have the opportunity to add their names to the Claret Jug for a second time. And at the end of the day, the Claret Jug is what this is all about. This is, this is why we play. This is it. All the greatest of the game that have ever played the game have come after this joke. It means you're holding history. Definitely the most special one. You know, this is, uh, this is it. It's magnificent. So that's what this is all about. Thank you very much. It's working, Johnny. Honestly, I've got goosebumps just watching that again. And you know, I'm not a golfer. I've already said I'm from Port Rush, but you did leave an incredible legacy. And I think the locals they were they were concerned beforehand. You know, were they going to get the bounce? Were they going to to feel that magic? Were they going to buy into it all? But they absolutely did. Um, and. I'm sure even though there's three years to go and you've a lot to do before then, I'm sure that machine is already whirring and in the background and I'm sure it is absolutely a military operation. Yeah, I, I absolutely is. I mean, I'm already beginning to work again on my Northern Irish accent <laughs> and I, we're travelling to Port Rush on quite a regular basis at the moment. And as I say, we're reviewing the course, reviewing the infrastructure, and I think I said in my talk, I genuinely have not known an atmosphere like it. And the town absolutely bought into it and made that championship what it was. The, the atmosphere was incredible. And that, that's a Scotsman saying that. That's, that's something. <laughs> I know you've the home of golf uh, coming up, of course, 150 years. Wish you every success for that. And thank you so, so much for being part of our conference today. And we're super excited for what lies ahead. And thanks for coming back. Thank, thank you very you. much to Johnny Cole Hamilton, Championship Executive Director from the RNA. We're going to move on now because we are delighted to have a fabulous uh, keynote with us. I'm going to take a seat now and invite our fabulous Alec, Alex Polizzi to the stage right now. 
Alex, it's so lovely to have you here today. Obviously, for those of you who don't know, third generation in the hotel dynasty, the Forte dynasty, started by your grandfather a long time ago. It's in your DNA, it's in your blood. But many of you will know Alex as the hotel inspector on Channel 5, uh, where I suppose you spend time with hoteliers who are struggling, who are maybe not wanting to listen to any positive or constructive criticism to improve. You've been doing that for so long now, but you're back on the road again. And it's great to see you here in Belfast, the first visit. Thank you, Ron. Am I, am I on? I am. I'm 50 years old and this is my first time ever to Northern Ireland. So uh, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Now, I believe you had a lovely experience last night. You were picked up by chef, he's all right, I suppose, Niall McKenna. I had um, a very nice experience last night. Yes, I was taken out to dinner. I was cooked for, in fact. And, um, and then I was taken to the Duke of York pub. Mm -hmm. And um, I managed to restrain myself to only two pints so that I was in good form tonight. But I could really have gone on all evening. I'm sure that could have led you astray. <laughs> um, you'll have to come back and do that properly the next time. You stayed in the Merchant? I did, and again, I'm really blown away. I'm sorry it's taken me so long to get here because I love it. And in fact, I called my husband this morning and I said, next time we've got a weekend away, I'd like to spend it in Belfast because there seems to be so much here. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, what's taken you so long, that's the thing. Um, so let's just talk. I mean, we're not just going to focus on, on hotels, but obviously that's what you do. That's absolutely in the blood. What, do, what are your first memories of... Be, of hotels and, and being involved? Well, I'm the eldest grandchild of a very large Catholic family. So Sunday lunch was always at my grandparents and all they ever did, the whole family, was talk about hotels and business the whole time. And being of that generation, we were still being told you had to be seen and not heard. So I heard an awful lot about hotels my whole life. And... Did you always know that this was going to be where you would find yourself? Was it obvious to you that, yep, I'm going to do this? No, because my grandfather told me that it's really hard work. He said you had to be dropped on your head as a baby to go into the hospitality industry. <laughs> well, as the third generation, we obviously have a problem with slippery fingers in our family. Um, I only went into it because I quickly ran down the list of other options and realised that nothing was going to give me so much joy. Just tell us a little bit about your early years then. What was, the, what was the first job? Because you didn't go straight into the family business. No, I wasn't allowed to, and quite rightly, thank goodness I was spared that. I went to Oxford, I read English, I was very academic, and that's something that I spend a lot of time talking to young people about, that this isn't, doesn't have to be a job for the terminally unacademic. You know, you can still be clever, know how to write a paper, pass exams, and choose to go into this industry. I went and I studied in, um, I went into hotel management in Hong Kong at the Mandarin Oriental, because it was one of the few places in the world that my grandfather didn't have a hotel. And I thought it was a good idea to see if I was any good at it before falling flat on my face in front of everybody watching. Well, good for you, because that, that's very admirable. And it, you, you know, you can't out your own career. Um, did you have any moments where you maybe fell flat on your face? Did you learn the hard way at times? Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I did really very quickly realise that I'd found the thing that I just wanted to do. Right. Um, I've been, I've enjoyed every single minute of my hotel career and I'm so glad I wouldn't have ever I, I've never even thought of doing anything else. And can you remember that actual moment? Because I think everybody has a, a sort of moment where you get that, I'm, I'm doing the right thing. I'm, I know my purpose. Well, I was, my proudest moment was, I was employee of the year at the Mandarin Oriental Hong Kong Ooh. in my first year of training. And I think that set me up for life. Now... Hotel inspector, let's talk about that. Um, I'm sure many of you have watched uh, Alex over the years and uh, I was reminding myself of some of those uh, episodes because if you do a quick Google, you can uh, find all sorts of, well, quite uncomfortable viewing. 
you met a lot of people who've been doing the same thing, probably boomers, uh, you know, for a long time, and that carpet's not sticky. There's nothing wrong with this. Um, I don't, I, I, and who is this woman? There's, there, you were called all sorts of things, actually. How dare you come in here and with your fancy ways and tell me what I'm doing wrong? Obviously, I work in television. I know what television is like, um, but that didn't look like acting. No, but I think the thing is, I'm with people a lot more than you ever see on the telly. And so I don't think they'd take what they have to take from me if I just went in all guns blazing. I tend to make friends with people before being rude to them. <laughs> um, and, um, and the truth is, they've invited me in. They've asked me to come and help them. And so what I always say is we've got a short amount of time together. I'm not doing you any favours unless I give the, you the unvarnished truth as quickly as possible, because then we can start trying to fix things. And is it always the hotel owner or manager has invited you in, or do you find it is, it comes from the head honcho? Yeah. Okay. And when they invite you in, is it more that they have to go through that process? They have to have a vent, they have to have a rant, I don't want to change. We don't like change. I think, I mean, that is human nature, isn't it? Nobody likes change. Um, and I actually sympathise enormously. Uh, it's incredibly hard to change our ways of working. And normally, I get to people by, at the time they've tried everything else. I mean, you have to be at a pretty low ebb to invite me in and the TV cameras. It is not a comfortable experience. Um, the truth is, they've tried every other avenue, and I'm their last chance. And if we look at sort of the outcomes and how many of them go on to actually, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, positive. Okay, so in 15 years, and I've done at least one series a year and sometimes two, if out of a series of eight hotels, I make a really big difference out of one or two, that is a successful year. And the really ones who've been incredibly successful, I can probably count on you know, the fingers of two hands. Probably 10 establishments over the course of a 15-year career in this have I really managed to help. And how does that make you feel? Please, I managed to help 10. Right, OK. <laughs> well, it's good TV, and obviously it keeps getting, um, you know, recommissioned. And you're out in the road again now. I am, and I think it's really interesting this time round. Last year in June, I opened my own hotel, my first own hotel, um, and it was really a traumatic experience. <laughs> and um, I think it's given me a better understanding again of the challenges that you face in this industry. And so I feel better prepared than I have for ages about really being able to get to grips with the challenges people are facing. So you have a totally different perspective. And if the hotel inspector was coming to inspect your hotel, maybe, you know, you'd understand. But you understand more. I think it's that thing when you don't, you know, if you don't have children, you don't understand. And then you have a baby and then your world changes. Um, is, that, is that what it's like? Yes. Yeah, someone said to me, was saying to me that they were sure that some of the guests come to my hotel and they um, are particularly critical because of the position, the role that I have on the TV. But I've said I've set myself up. Um, as, you know, a, a big thing to aim at, so I can't complain when they take a shot. You know, I, I hopefully I do my best. So tell me about the hotel then. So I have a 30-bedroom hotel. I have about 55 staff, part-time, full-time, all through the generations. Um, and I have been working breakfast, lunch and dinner about 80 hours a week, um, trying to get it off the ground and make it a success. Right. Well, I mean, that's very humbling. And um, when we hear that, we perhaps, you know, can jump to all sorts of assumptions about, oh, she probably is only there part time. But, you know, it's you've got children and you've got a husband and that's quite far away from where your hotel is. How challenging has it been? <laughs> Well, I mean, anyone who has children knows that that's why one goes to work, right? <laughs> so, um, and my husband is a bit long-suffering, but, I, you know, I really, really, really enjoy what I do. Mm. I mean, I don't always enjoy the hours of polishing cutlery or plates or any of the other things that I do to encourage everyone else to do it properly. But there's something incredibly satisfying 
in this industry, and that is making sure that a guest leaves feeling like they've had the best time they could possibly have had anywhere. And, um, and I think that's something that I'm really good at ensuring. You know, I work with a, a lot of different industries and interview a lot of different people, and I've heard a lot said over the last couple of years about the danger of perfectionism. We're always striving to be perfect. But is it the case that in the hospitality industry, that's the only thing you can strive for? I think that it's impossible to be perfect. And I think the thing about not being perfect and people not having a good time is that you really do have to see this as an opportunity to improve. And one of the things I love more than anything else about my job is the opportunity to turn someone who's had a bad experience into a loyal customer. And that is all about how you communicate with people, about how you fix the problem. It isn't about free stuff. It is about having a genuine interest and care and concern about the fact that someone has been disappointed in their experience with you. Um, you can't ask people to be perfect. Now, when you decided to open up last year, did you think you were going to be working 80 hours a week? Well, I should have known better, shouldn't I? But um, I, the, the, the recruitment problem in the hospitality industry has been happening for a long time. This isn't a glamorous job, at least it hasn't been perceived as one. And so I saw the trends, but actually it is harder now than it has ever been before. And um, I think one of the reasons I work so hard is to show my staff and to share with my staff why it is worth doing this and why I have a smile on my face every day. I mean, when I walk in at seven o'clock in the morning and I'm still very old fashioned, I say good morning to everyone. I expect them to say good morning back to me. I expect them to look me in the eye. They say to me, how are you, Alex? And I always say, living the dream. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, why else would you go to work? It, of course you need to put food on the table. Of course you need to put a roof over your head. But I spend more hours at work than I do anywhere else. And you can't do that unless you love it. And what about the staff? I mean, Paul's presentation was fascinating there. Um, but I know we spoke uh, prior to today. And you said it's so important that we stop just looking at, at the younger people to recruit. Yeah, I think um, we have to look. There's lots of things. I think lots of people who've retired are happy to come back on um, doing less hours. And in fact, I've seen that. Someone, in, I went to Mauritius a couple of years ago and they were already doing that. They were bringing back um, retired staff to try and give some continuity to guests. I also think that... In the same way as young people now are really interested in environmental justice, they're really interested in social justice. And so I think I personally work quite a lot with um, a, a, a charity for young learning disabled adults. And, you know, you have to change the way you work. You have to be very specific about what you need. Your expectations have to be different. Um, but there's a huge untapped resource and a pool of people who are desperate to be working, who are desperate to be part of a community, to feel part of something. And actually, um, this is an opportunity to reach out to them too. And, you know, that's all well and good. That's a wonderful aspiration to have but it comes with challenge. It's not perhaps as easy to do that. Um, what, have you had any experience? Have you, have you started on that journey yourself? Oh gosh, yes, I have, I have a couple of learning disabled adults working at the Star, um, and I'd like to employ some more. And I think, um, you know, the thing is, uh, inevitably, what it's taught me in the law of unintended consequences is it makes everybody happier. It can be a bit difficult in the beginning to integrate them and to work out how, in the same way as it is to integrate the generations. But actually, it's an opportunity for people to feel good about their workplace. And I think that is, again and again, what I think is a, a way that we can encourage people to enjoy doing this kind of work. Well, Paul's been talking also about the great resignation and, and the millennials that are saying, do you know what? 
I need something better than this. I want to have a life and, a, you know, I want to work in a certain way that allows me to live the life that I want. Um, do you take that on board as well? And how do you manage that? I absolutely do. I mean, it's hard for someone of my age. Again, I'm 50. You know, you interview someone and they say, I only want to work 25 hours a week or I only want to work 20 hours a week or 30 hours a week or whatever it is. I don't care what anyone wants to work. They have a complete right to their life. What I ask is once they've committed to it, they stick to it. Mm -hmm. um, so I try, you know, people like... The, the only way the hotel runs is by the few oldies like me doing those 70-hour weeks, but I don't mind doing it. And then I have a huge, massive talent pool of younger people who are all dropping in and out for a day. They'll do an evening shift. They'd rather not work Sundays. You know, okay, fine. You have to be flexible about it. Otherwise, you are never going to be able to fill that rotor. So would you recommend anybody in here who's got a burning desire to open a hotel to do so? <sighs> I would never recommend it to anyone. <laughs> no. um, so back to your staff. Uh, culture is, is hugely important. And, and we know that uh, people will be loyal when they feel looked after, when they feel that you've taken on board, that they only want to work there 20 hours a week or whatever. But let's look at the, the, the nature of, of hospitality. We know that the hours are very antisocial. That's that's what it needs to be. It's that nighttime economy for, for most places. Um, you know, how, how do you deal with that? Because what I hear from a lot of my friends, and I have, I have young people, children as well, so, you know, you sort of think, well, he's only working in a bar. He hasn't, you know, he's, he doesn't really know what to do with himself. How do we change that attitude in parents? Well, I think there's lots of things there to unpick. I think most of us as parents want our children to be happy and they want them to be doing, having a productive life. I mean, I've already got my 13-year-old daughter waitressing and I've already got my nine-year-old son at the reception desk. And, um, and I think uh, hard work never killed anybody. Um, I think it's very important to understand what it is that people find rewarding about the work. We've just undergone a big exercise at the start to try and recruit better. We've talked to all our, lots of the young people in every department and we've asked them, the good ones, why it is that they come and they work with us rather than someone else. And what they've said again and again is it's the cohort that they're with, it's the respect they're shown, it is the culture that one encourages. Um, and I think you cannot anymore expect it just to be a top-down business. I mean, just as um, you were saying, sir, I think you learn as much from the young as they do from you. That's really, really interesting. And uh, the culture and the, the nature of the work as well. In the past, it's maybe been that night time, sit down, have a drink afterwards. You know, wasn't maybe the healthiest of lifestyles. You've got a good policy on that one. Oh, I've got a very good policy Learned on Learned the that hard one. way. I, I definitely am, um, I definitely drink too much. And it's years of being in this industry. And the only way to relax, and the only people to relax with were people I worked with. In, um, at the star, for example, I have a rule that anyone who works an evening shift always has can have an alcoholic or a non-alcoholic drink on me at the end of their shift, but that is all they're allowed. After that, I expect them to go home because I think what we all did was we sat around for hours in a bar um, giving them back the money that we just earned. <laughs> So. Yep, I think absolutely. But that, that's great. So you've taken that on board. You know that maybe that wasn't the healthiest for you. Um, and it works? It works really well. I mean, I think young people drink a lot less than mm. us old fogies do. Um, and I've also had to relax. You know, in the old days, do you remember? You used to be told there were no piercings and no jewellery and no nail varnish. And Well, all of that has gone by the wayside. As long as someone looks clean and neat and tidy. I mean, I've got a wonderful young waitress with a great big ring through her nose. I mean, it isn't my taste, but she turns up to work. She looks after my guests properly. It's not my business what she chooses to pierce. <clears throat> yes. So, uh, 
<laughs> getting the right people, though, because there has been a, a criticism, and maybe unfairly, of younger generations not having those same social skills because we've seen the phones have been out a lot. I was working with somebody recently and at an event, and there, were, there was a whole team of people, and the first thing that the event organiser did was take all the phones away from all the waiting staff. I thought, well, it's a bit draconian, but... You know, what do you do? How do you how do you nurture the social skills and the softer skills? Well, I think that is why the hospitality industry is something that every young person should experience. I think if it teaches you anything, it teaches you how to look someone in the eye, appropriate ways of uh, connecting with someone, of talking to someone, appropriate ways of dress. Um, I personally wouldn't dream of bringing my phone into work. In, I, I never have my phone in my pocket. And because I don't have my phone in my pocket, I can ask other people not to have it either. But everyone has their breaks. They all sit there in the staff room. They probably... I think they even rather text each other rather than talking to each other across the table. <laughs> but, um, you know... A stint working in hospitality teaches you an awful lot about life and I really encourage, I go into lots of schools and talk to young people and I encourage them. You don't have to think of this as a job for life, but it is a job that will help you with life. Uh, over the pandemic, obviously, we know and everybody in this room knows the challenges that face the hospitality sector. And, you know, technology as well, the QR codes came in. But really, do you feel that it is that face-to-face -face customer experience? Is the QR code experience enough? I don't do the QR code experience, but then I'm a certain generation. What I think, I mean, if the, who was, was it the head of Ikea who said we've all got enough stuff, we now want experiences? Well, I believe that 100%. Um, when I opened the hotel, one of the things that I did, we opened the hotel because we like walking in the area. And so every room has five walks in a little wallet at the side of the bed. I encourage everybody to talk to guests, to tell them what to do, because that is what makes it memorable. You don't want someone to then get in their car and go off to Brighton, or you want people to get out or outside the hotel and experience some of the wonders of the world around them. We've also heard from our speakers at the start, from Tina and from Xavier, um, about the cost of living crisis. We know that perhaps customers, some customers don't have the same money to spend. And I know that your offering could be deemed as being high end, but you're surrounded by locals that you want to maybe include too, and that's important to you. I think it's a really difficult balancing act always. I mean, we only buy local, as I'm sure everyone here is aware, local can often be code for more expensive. Um, we try not to use the big suppliers. Um, so prices are high. And I think, again, I see that as an opportunity to really zero in on the fact that you can't afford to waste anything. Um, I loathe waste more than really, really loathe waste. And so I think um, you encourage, it's a kind of, it is a circular thing. You hope that guests are going to come here, they're going to enjoy themselves. Your margins might be slightly squeezed, but you're still doing the best you can, both for your guests and for the planet. And do you feel, though, that the customer offering um, has something for, for every budget? I would like to think so. I mean, it costs you, you can come in for tea and a scone and spend a certain amount and you'll be treated in the same way and have the same cutlery and crockery as you do if you come and have a £300 night. Um, we have a lot of locals visit us. Um, I support a lot of local events and charities because I think it's absolutely essential to be embedded in the community and to make your local clientele feel as if they're as respected and needed as the highest spending outsiders. Yeah, so important. Um, the theme of this conference, obviously, and we've been hearing fabulous presentations all through the day, has been about recovery. It's about sustainability. It's about innovation. Um, just to leave people with a few thoughts, we've got lots of representatives from lots of different sectors, visitor attractions, hoteliers. Uh, we've got restaurants, bars. In your view, and, you know, we... we actually think you're a fantastic expert. Your advice is always spot on. What advice or what takeaways would you have for everybody here today on what they can do today to improve their customer offering? 
Oh, my goodness, that's a big one. Um, I think, inevitably, one has to really be stringent about making sure that you get the basics right. There are no excuses for not making sure that places aren't clean and that um, staff aren't trained, etc., etc. I do think that the, the business advice I give to everybody, boringly, again and again, is that the temptation is to spend most of our time on things that we're good at because it's fun. You should spend most of your time on the one thing that you're really, really bad at. 80% of your time should be spent doing the things that you need to improve, not the things that you enjoy and are good at. So I don't know if that's helpful, but That's hopefully. extremely helpful. <laughs> it's something, the first thing I would think not to do. So super advice. Alex, I could talk to you all day, but I, I don't want to hog you because I'm sure there's a lot of people in here have a few questions for you. But do you know what? We're actually going to invite back our other speakers uh, from today who are still with us. Uh, Tina O'Dwyer, uh, Xavier Font and Paul Redmond and also John McGrillan from Tourism NI. But for now, Alex, thank you. Thank you. Um, you can, w w all so the girls at one end and the boys at the other. We'll, we'll break up the colours, so, we'll spread the colour, we'll spread, spread the, the joy. Fabulous. There you go, Paul. Um, so we're almost at the end of uh, our conference today. Um, John, actually, just, you know, we, we heard from you this morning, it already seems like a long time ago. We've talked a lot about the impact of of COVID and the pandemic, and we're all about recovery. How has it been for Tourism NI during that time? Well, it was, I mean, it was interesting for me sitting there listening to, to Paul's presentation, which I thought was absolutely fascinating because I suppose I'm one of the, I'm a baby boomer. So, you know, I am by far one of the oldest people in our organization and we are populated by a large number of young people, you know, mostly millennials. And you know, I was just thinking about, you know, what, how we've responded over the last two years. And I, I suppose Paul made the point about the why. And for me, you know, important thing from my perspective was to try to get a message across. Because we had an industry here which was in absolute crisis when, when COVID arrived. And we all walked out the door of our building on the 19th of March. We all went home. But I thought it was critical for me to get a message across to say, we have a really important role to play here. You know, we're not at the coal face, but we can't help and we need to do absolutely everything we can to help. And why do we need to help? Because this industry employs 70,000 people. Those people have got families, they put bread on the table, and it's in a really difficult place. And so I saw my job was to get that message across and to go to government and go to politicians and try and find the money where we could, we could make a difference. In terms of the how, I mean, the how came from all of the people who work for me. Those millennials who were in the management positions. So when we decided what the programs were going to look like, I, I really didn't have very much input into that at all. That was people very quickly coming back and sort of saying, we need to provide free legal advice, we need to provide you know, free financial advice, we need to create demands, we need to do X, Y, and Z. And you know, that's what ultimately formulated the package of support we were able to give. And I suppose you know, that was reflective of, again, the point that Paul made, giving people purpose, because I think everybody felt a purpose. And I got, you know, that was a palpable sense of that, that everybody thought, we can make a difference and we want to make a difference. And you know, the one difference I would have seen between you know, what actually happened and what we talked about today, I mean, people weren't working 25 hours or weren't, you know, people worked themselves into the ground, you know, literally did. Um, I think were exhausted after two years because they absolutely had that sense of purpose and they wanted to make that difference. And I mean, I, just so much of what Paul said to me or said there today really resonated with me and, 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 and how things pl panned out with us over the last two years. Brilliant, John. We have um, some roving mics, so please do raise your hand at this point and we will get a microphone to you if you have a question for any of our speakers. So uh, I will keep an eye out uh, for hands raised. But it, uh, oh, we've got one. Okay, well spotted, Xavier. If you want to tell us who you are, where you're from, that would be brilliant. Uh, is there a little button there that you can press? That on now? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, Martin Carey from Morn Heritage Trust. Partly an observation, partly a question. Um, firstly, to welcome the focus on sustainability. 
uh, which is important for all the reasons mentioned. Uh, really inspiring talks from Tina and Javier and some terrific ideas for how businesses can be more sustainable. I think uh, one of the big challenges for us in Northern Ireland though is how we step up to be sustainable as a destination. So not what the individual businesses do, but what our authorities do on things like sustainable transport, uh, sustainable path networks, infrastructure for accessing and getting folk around. So um, just interested in the panel's reflections on that. And I think one of the challenges has been our fragmented nature of responsibilities within government and the public sector for all the areas that need to play a part there infrastructure, community, economy, etc. Um, I'm just wondering what the panel thinks in terms of the potential of destination management organisations to drive sustainability. Well, Javier, I know we don't have the local knowledge, but I'm sure you have experiences or um, you know, comparisons you so, could make. <clears throat> this is a universal problem. Okay? Um, I recently worked with a World Tourism Organisation to analyse 100 national tourism policies. Every single one of them said sustainability is important in the executive summary. 55% of them dedicated more than one paragraph to talk about sustainability in the actual body of the policy. 2% of them had measurable KPIs on sustainability. Mm. What the <laughs> and, and, and you know what's the worst for me? So, so we need evidence-based policy. We need to collect better data on sustainability and then whether we like the data or not, we need to take policy decisions to follow the data. Yesterday I met with Rachel and Jack, who I don't know where they are now, from Visit Belfast, and I'll be working with them for the next year on this topic. And there'll be some uncomfortable moments where we'll look at some market segments that will say, the carbon footprint is really high and the economic benefit per person per day is really low. Are we so desperate we really want every single tourist, no matter what the actual costs are, and we normally say yes. And why do we say yes? Because the benefits are for me, and the costs are paid by somebody else. And that's not fair. It's a great point, actually, as well. So, yeah, um, it, it will take a little bit of discomfort to get to where we need to go. Alex, I suppose, I mean, there have been so many spin-offs as well um, from the hotel inspector, but having somebody come in and actually, if you don't know what you're, you're doing wrong, um, you can't improve. Oh gosh, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I really think it's interesting what, what you... I paid enormous attention to what you were saying today, both of you. And, um, and must do better is on my re record card. Uh, Tina, if I could ask you a question as well. Um, one of the issues uh, that has been raised in relation to micro-businesses engaging with sustainability is that the accreditation journey is often onerous and expensive. Have you any advice on this? Do businesses always have to go down that accreditation route? It's, it's a huge question and everybody who answers it, including me, will have you know their own perspective and their own agenda. And it is one of those areas that there's complete, I think, lack of clarity, which is, which is you know, a bit ridiculous when you think it's about certification and standards that in itself it has confusion and within it even a small um, scope for greenwashing. You know, get your certification, get your tick and on you go. Um, do businesses, it is certainly an onerous and time consuming process and it comes at a cost. Um, but the benefit of that process for those who go through it is it is a framework and a, a, a structure on the journey of what you need to do. So it kind of lays out the path, it tells you what kind of criteria you need to work towards, and, and usually certification bodies will provide training and support for that as well. So it helps you along the journey. The, I suppose the, the, the rub with it is, um, you can get the tick and then keep going as ever, and you mm -hmm. can also, the, Xavier mentioned it as well, it's not a marketing tool as yet and there's little evidence that consumers actually make decisions on the back of it. It's a little bit of a, you know, it's a reassurance but it's not a, it's not a decider. And that's where the balance for SMEs and micro businesses are is can I invest all that time and money when I can't see the direct commercial return on it? And it's a big question. Sorry, one more thing. There's a blind spot here. We talked about intergenerations. But actually, all the work I'm doing at the moment for World Tourism Organization is showing that women that are employed in the tourism sector have suffered a lot more from COVID than men. 
And when we build strategies for tourism, we tend to say, we're a great employer of women, of people who are younger and people who need less training. And yet our national tourism strategies do not have a gender lens. Mental well-being, pressures are shared from work and from home. People who are, were on zero-hour contracts were much more likely to be women. Women have suffered much, much harder. Why don't we know it? Because most of the people taking decisions wear suits like me. They're men. Right? And it's the, it's the next layer who are females. And so men are still taking decisions for men. Paul, I don't know whether you want to come in on that because we've been hearing, you know, you know it all when it comes to the, to the generations. But um, we have learned a lot during the pandemic. We know that we don't have to do things in the same way. Um, but what advice would you give to people who have staff and employees? You've already told us we need to listen better, but how can we... It's one thing listening, and, and, and the next is actually doing something with that information that you've heard. Yeah, I, I've got this You've on. got that on. I think um, the whole issue about generations is, I, I keep trying to say this, that it's embedded in us. So we, we make lots of assumptions all the time about how we see the world, and it's very difficult to challenge ourselves. I think, as Alex was saying, you know, it, we, we see the world from our own generation-specific perspective. So I think talking to younger generations about why we need you to behave like this is, is, a, is a really important thing we can do. Our junior doctors, for example, one of the biggest problems they have with, when they go on the wards is they call every patient by their first name. So straight away, they've offended groups of people who are thinking, who the hell is this 12-year-old <laughs> <laughs> calling me by my name? Um, but we had to explain it to them that for other generations, you don't call them by their first name. Mm. They didn't know Mr. that. And Mrs. And they said, well, why didn't anyone tell me that? And I think we make these assumptions all the time. So having a conversation um, is, is the number one thing to do. Don't yeah. be afraid to talk about it. Alex, I'd just like to make a comment. Um, I know, I think that our industry has really suffered because zero hours contracts are always seen as a bad thing. But in fact, for many, many women that I employ, zero hours contracts are a good thing because it means that one week they can work X number of hours and the week that their child's on holiday, they say that they don't want to work at all. So I think we've also got to explain that there is a rebalancing. It isn't all, all the power isn't in the hands of the employer. The power is in the hands of the employee and the sooner we recognise that, the better. Any other questions, folks, at this point? I'm looking around the room. Um, I have another question for Paul. Um, and it comes to, to uh, not necessarily succession planning, but creating leaders of the future. So to allow Alex not to have to work 80 hours a week and go home, how do you get that person that's going to do it as well as you? And how do you train them to yeah. have that same culture and that same loyalty and dedication when it's not oh, your it, business? This is really, really hard. Mm. Big question. Uh, uh, one, of the, one of the challenges is recognising that they, they might not do things like I would do. Uh. That's, that's the challenge that I've got at the university, re realising that I've had to challenge myself that maybe, you know, when I'm the one, only one who's not working from home, for example, maybe it's me. And it's really difficult to, to try and come to terms with that. So, in a sense, having to, to, to almost, almost, as I said, make the familiar strange to try and understand why I behave some of these and challenge these assumptions. But I have to recognise that the next generation of leaders might not see the world in the same way. They might lead in a different way. Yeah, really good point. Um, also, when you are managing younger people and generations that perhaps you're not familiar with or, or au fait with, we're terribly terrified of doing the wrong thing, as yeah, you said, and ending yeah. up in, in some kind of yeah. HR inquiry or tribunal. How do you tell people off? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to, you have to be aware that they're par it's the parents. The parents who, who, who are hovering. Yes. The parents are hovering. Yes. Um, the, the parents are hovering. So you have to be aware that, that you have to be able to justify it. Um, so, you know, I've, I've had, I, I chair disciplinary panels uh, with students and I'm aware that parents are coming in and demanding to come in um, and they're demanding to bring lawyers 
with them in some cases. My parents didn't even know which university I went to. Um, we got but, smacked. Yeah. If, you, if you challenged authority, you got a smack. Yeah. So it's, I think you have to challenge this. But again, we've got to be really careful. And I think to, to depersonalize things and focus on the, the work. So take the personal out. I think about the, the great tellings off I had from bosses in the past. Often they were personal tellings off. That had nothing to do with the job. It was about me. Um, so I think it's, it's focusing on the task, but being ready that you will be challenged and get ready for the parents. Um, I think also, again, our industry has become so much better. When I was training, there were still chefs who threw things at you, you know, yeah. you were threatened, you felt physically threatened quite often. Yeah. I mean, that is all now completely unacceptable, and that has made our industry better. So I agree with you. It, you do have to tread carefully, but the main thing is to have very strong HR policies um, and to document everything very carefully and to always feel as if, you know, you do have to know that you're in the right, basically. Yeah. And what about investing in those staff? Because there's always that danger that you invest in them and then they leave and they do something else. But that's just life now, isn't it? It is just life. And I always like to think of it... What, I've trained someone brilliantly and someone else is going to benefit of it from it. I mean, that is the way of the world. I'm happy to accept that. The main thing is that hopefully they get a good enough experience with me to set them on the right path for the rest of their working careers. I feel that very strongly with young people. Paul? And we should make it easy for them to come back. Yeah. So younger generations see nothing wrong with leaving an organisation then returning a couple of years later a couple of weeks later. They see nothing wrong with that. So I've, I've worked with a number of firms, um, high street firms, that have made it easy. They, they welcome them back. And that so it's that revolving door, but also maybe they want to do a bit of backpacking, maybe they want to do a bit of travel, and they want to live their lives, and that's okay. Tina? I heard a good line on that as well. You know, what if I invest in my people and they leave? And the response was, well, what if you don't invest in them and they stay? Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, it's... it's a lot of nods in here. <laughs> yeah. So I suppose it's that gig, gig economy as well. You know, you can do a little bit here and a little bit there. And skills in the hospitality industry, you can take anywhere in the world. John? Well, I mean, I'm sort of thinking about my own organisation because, you know, we employ 140 people. Um, and there are a lot of people in this room who used to work for us, who don't work for us any longer, who have gone on to greater and better things. And, you know... I used to work in Belfast City Council, and that was the same. When I looked around, when I, you know, see the people who were running this place, who were running Titanic Belfast, um, you know, Titanic Foundation, they were all former employees. So we're a sort of breeding ground, you know, where, where, where we sort of hopefully develop talent, and that talent moves on and it starts to seed elsewhere, you know. And in the public sector, we, you know, we can't really compete in salaries quite often, so we just got to recognise the fact that the best thing we can do is to take the talent, develop that talent the best it can, and if it moves on, it moves on. You know, yeah. it will be for the good of the industry, which is why we're here in the first instance, really, and, you know, we benefit from that. And just, I mean, coming back to the point about telling people off, I mean, my own personal experience of that is getting told off does not motivate you to do anything any better, and I think the important thing is to, if you're not happy, is to explain to people why you're not happy, and the impact of what has, you know, of, of the action that's been taken. And I think when you do that, most people do understand that and, 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 and respond to it. Um, so, you know, just picking up on that point, you know, I, I, I think we've got to manage and we've got to sort of lead people in a, in a somewhat different way. And it comes back to the point, I think, that, you know, Paul made earlier. It's about the why. Mm -hmm. and why these things are important and why we expect people to do things in a particular way. There are many people in this room that will be struggling with staff and how, getting staff at the minute. I mean, it's universal. And, you know, as somebody who likes to go to restaurants and visit many across Northern Ireland, you can see the problems. Um, two years has, has hit service and hospitality um, hard. What's Tourism NI doing to help train, to help recruit, to help deliver on this. We heard the, the yeah. minister, whether he's going to be the minister going forward, um, talk about a strategy. Yeah, well, well, I suppose to some extent, and it comes back to the point that was made by uh, Martin earlier, I mean, we're, we're quite fragmented in terms of how we deliver services to industry in Northern Ireland. And the responsibility for skills and skills development doesn't necessarily rest with us, it rests with another part of DFE. But I do think we have identified you know, that we have a, there is a role that we can play 
um, because we, you know, we, we interface with the industry every day. And you know, one of the things we did last year when we had you know, resource available to us, we ran a, you know, a very significant campaign to really to try to change the perception of the industry in order to make it more attractive and to work with the industry to identify you know, the real challenges that they had and what we needed to do to attract people into the sector. And it comes back to the point that, you know, that the, great, you know, the great resignation, it's, it's an employee's market and we've got to sell ourselves to the employee as opposed to, you know, in my day where I was going around, you know, university and trying to sell myself to 23 potential employers, we're in a different space at this point in time. And I think it's important we recognise that. I would also like to say, I think it's a responsibility of every single person who's involved in the hospitality industry and who loves it, like I do, to stand up and say that all the time, that this isn't a job for idiots. It isn't a job. I used to joke that if there were four sons in the family, the first would inherit, the second went into the army, the third went into the church, and the fourth idiot son was probably sent to hospitality school. But, you know, we've got to make sure that people understand that this is a wonderful, wonderful career path if they're interested in it it is a worthy choice and Javier you're working with so many students now and you know that when you have a, a lecture theater full of young people or whatever age in front of you they're going to get they're going to get a job our students all have jobs I mean the, and this is the best year ever for employment in hospitality and tourism you know, the number of jobs, most of the students are finishing this year, they're going straight into jobs straight away because there's such a shortage and there are some really good jobs available. Also, the university that I'm at is near London, so obviously salaries are high, but staff turnover is high because cost of living is insane. You know, but, 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 but what young people want from a job is very different. So any one of you that has any single procedure in the organisation and you haven't questioned it, and you say, I'm doing it like this because we've always done it that way. Oh boy. Yeah. You're in trouble. John? Yeah, I mean, I think it was Alex made the point, you know, that by working in the, in the hospitality sector, you learn the life skills, you know, that, that can really progress you. And I mean, one of the interesting facts is that, you know, 50% of young people find their first job in the hospitality sector. And I think, you know, when we look at policies and we look at, you know, those sectors of the economy which we think you know is going to drive growth and drive productivity the hospitality industry is often a stepping stone you know where people learn those life skills and i'm tired sort of making this example but now mckenna is in the room or at least was in the room now mckenna gave my niece a job three years ago part-time university she's now a digital analyst working for a bank when she was interviewed she weren't wasn't asked any questions about digital technology, assuming coming out of university, she knew that. They wanted to know, what did she learn working for Nile? What did she learn about dealing with customers? What did she learn working for a team? What did she learn about problem solving? And, you know, even if, you know, people are coming in the industry and it might be a stepping stone somewhere else, it's got a really important role to play in developing the skill set of the wider economy. And I think we've got a very important role to play in that. And it's not always recognised. I think that's a great place to end. Um, thank you so, so much to our panellists today. I'll just look out and see if anybody... Oh, we've got a... I was going to do one, one last troll. Hello. Let's get a microphone. Hold your hand up there and we'll get a microphone to you. If you want to just tell us who you are. Where are you uh, from? My name is Jeff, Jeff McKinney. Um, I just have a humble self-catering who has no employees. Um, I was wondering... Um, if anybody in the body of the hall here um, has anyone who is a zero hours contract, because in, I have never hired anybody to do any work for me. Uh, the zero hours being probably one of the oldest people in the, in the room. Um, I only have heard bad things about zero hours apart from Alex's comments, which I understand. And um, are there, is there anybody else in the, in the room who has zero hours? Hands up, everybody who has somebody with zero hours. One, two, not, not very many. Yeah, a few. A few, maybe, maybe eight, maybe 10. Yeah. Okay, do but you feel like you'd like some help? No, no, I don't know. Oh. <laughs> do you want Alex to come in? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Um, what, what the problem is that um, anything I've heard about zero hours mostly is bad because the, the employer can offer the employee 
hardly anything. They can sack about any time, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are so many bad things I have heard about it. I'm sure Alex is probably a very good, uh, uh, good employer, uh, but just wondering what everybody else thought about it. Yeah. So I mean. Julia Cork, he's probably in the room here who runs this place, but in, in a previous life, I had responsibility for uh, the, this, this part of uh, the council's business as it was then. Uh, and like we had a rebellion from the union around you know, zero hours contract and we're, we're making that point. And the reality is the staff were you know, really were appreciative of the fact that there were zero hour contracts. And it comes down to the culture of the organization in which you know, a zero hour contract is used. Because the staff in here, Many of them were in you know, other jobs. This is a part-time job. It gives them the opportunity to work on weekends, opportunity to work you know, in the, you know, the auditorium you know, in, 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 in the evenings, come along when big acts were playing. Everybody who worked here found that to their benefit mm. because the culture that existed it's made sure a, that It's just a that little bit of a dirty so word. Perhaps it, the media has um, had something to do with that, Jeff. But maybe we need to think about zero hours in a different way. You can still be good to the people that you give a zero hour. Yeah. No, it's it's very it's a great question. Thank you, Jeff. And there's a lady down here. I think we've just once. Oh, great. Oh, there we go, Jeff. Some help here. Hi, um, my name's Alison, and I manage the Guild Hall in Derry. It's a local government. Uh, premises, visitor attraction. So we went out, uh, we had recruitment recently and we went out for full-time and part-time jobs and some people applied and asked only to go on a casual list of zero hours. So I just want to say some people requested that through the recruitment. So, so there's a whole market, but there's a whole workforce out there that perhaps aren't being represented. So think of it in a different way. Yeah? Yeah. Great. Any other questions? And then we're going to... Oh, my goodness, they're all starting now. You see? You just waited to the last minute. We'll get one over to you. Raise your hand again there. Brilliant. So if you want to tell us who you are, that would be great. Yeah, uh, sure. My name is Emil. Um, I'm from Digital Side, with 3 d Virtual Tours. And uh, I have a question for all the speakers, something to conclude the session today. If you were to write a book about tourism after the pandemic, what title would you give it? <laughs> okay, which end will I start at? Do you, want to, do you need a second? What title would you give it? Well, that's a big question, Emil. So, yeah, there might even be what challenge, opportunity. But, Paul, could you think of a title you would give to this post pandemic recovery? Uh, um, great expectations. Yeah. Great expectations. <laughs> Been done before at work that time. Very good. <laughs> Alex, beat that. God, I don't, I'm not nearly as clever. Um, <laughs> I can't think. Move on and I'll have okay. to Okay, John, thinking. anybody else got a title there? Well, I, think, I think I would see if it is Alex here or this one. That's, that's we need a little more too. time, Emil. It'll come to us in the middle of the night tonight. Oh, God, I should have said that. <laughs> the only way is up. The sky yeah. is the limit. Love it. Yeah. Okay. The song's coming on. I don't have anything that witty to say, sorry. <laughs> well, do you know what? We've got two great titles yeah. there and definitely some food for thought. Um, yeah. Talking about food, we are moving towards lunchtime. Um, I want to thank all of our panellists here today. It's been brilliant. Uh, you've been wonderful, each individually speaking, but thank you for such an entertaining panel discussion to Paul, to Alex, to John, to Tina and to Xavier. Thank you. Thank you. And now I'd like to uh, welcome to the stage Terence Brannigan, chairman, of course, of Tourism NI, who would like to say some closing words before we head off. But don't forget, we will be networking and uh, everything will be here until much later today. So you have a couple of hours to chat after this. But Terence, for now, over to you. Thank you, Sarah, and uh, thank you to the panel. Um, Fear not, um, the other 20 pages of my speech are being printed as we speak. Um, so, oh, by the way, um, in terms of the book title, perhaps to ill and back. Um, but let's move on to um, the closing stage of, of, uh, of today's conference. Oh, um, Paul, is that kind of dressed down Friday? Dressed down Friday. Um, this is somewhat of a bittersweet occasion for me. 
um, as it represents one of my last engagements as chairman of Tourism and I after more than seven years. Although Terry McCartney, some of you would be glad to see the back of me. Um, if you'd be kind enough to indulge me to expand on that in a, in a moment. First of all, I'd like to reflect on today's proceedings. The theme of our conference was an innovative and sustainable future. Our focus has been on getting you to think about how we forge a tourism industry that's not just resilient, but it's both forward-looking and forward-thinking. That means not only being able to meet challenges such as those we have faced in the past few years, but grasping the opportunities presented by new thinking and by new technology. And to that end today, we've heard from Xavier and Tina on the changing focus of tourism development, highlighting how tourism can benefit its host communities, not simply in terms of economic growth, but in terms of regenerative effects and social benefit. Paul has set a compelling vision for where the world of work may be taking us, with everyone, everyone reevaluating what that means to them in a post-COVID world. Johnny has talked about the exciting plans for the return of the Open to our shores after the hugely successful 148th champ championship in 2019. And wow, what an event, what a party that was. It was the biggest event ever, bar none, that we've ever hosted here in Northern Ireland, and one that I feel privileged to have taken place during my time as Chairman of Tourism NI. And of course, we've had the discussion with Alex from a hospitality dynasty. We've had the discussion, which I feel sure you all found as thought-provoking and Alex as entertaining as I did. I want to thank each of today's speakers for their engaging and inspirational contributions. And I'd particularly like to say a special word of thanks to Sarah for her sterling work in hosting today's program. <clears throat> and Paul, I, I, I was listening for more than the 14 seconds, uh, the goldfish moment. Um, so out of my 40 seconds of concentration, um, here are some of the things that I wrote down uh, from each of our, our contributors. Tina, the leaner and greener, the better and brighter, the louder and prouder. Just take that home with really. you. Really important. I love that last piece, Tina. Um, what if you don't invest and they stay? Xavier, um, ask nicely. Be trustworthy, be honest, be humorous, be engaging. Johnny, in his presentation, brought a lump to my throat watching the clip of the 2019 Open Championship again. And in 2025, we're talking about 250,000, a quarter of a million attendants. Who would have dreamt that we could attract such a crowd and deliver? pictures of this wonderful place to over 100 million people worldwide. Paul, uh, I, uh, so much of what you said uh, chimed with me, and I'll tell you why. That patronizing dad mode, I get it, believe me. Um, you're lucky that, uh, was Jane Austen your girlfriend? It's Cleopatra with me. Um, Dressed on Friday, I, I, I'm going to remember uh, that now. I'll just unbutton the, take off the tie and unbutton the jacket. A digital immigrant, for goodness sake, ballpoint pen is technology for me. Um, I was that person with the inkwell, uh, dabbing my pen in. So every generation is a new people. Every generation is a new people. It's really interesting for me because in my home, um, I am a baby boomer. I am a baby boomer. Um, but I've got children that are actually Generation Z. 
So I'm just over 70. They're in their early 20s. Think about that as a gap talking to my children. Um, and in fact, the great thing about talking to my children is I've done exactly what you had suggested. They become my mentors. So I listen to them about how to engage with their generation. You talked about continu continuous partial attention. At my age, it's no tension at all. Um, so that listen, what do you think? The 40 seconds, the purpose, why? Why you want them to do things or why you want them to do things the way in which you want them to do it. That intergenerational conversation. The digital intelligence matched to the emotional intelligence. This is all smart stuff that we should take away from all of our speakers today. When I joined Tourism NI as chairman back in 2015, one of my earliest engagements was a visit to the Sleeve Donner Hotel for our Meet the Buyer welcome dinner. That was followed the very next morning by a media day at Royal County Down, ahead of its hosting of the 2015 Irish Open. So think about that. Meet the buyer, welcome dinner the night before, media engagement the whole day the next day. I commend to you two very important observations from those two days. The first, do not, do not take on a, me a day of media interviews after a big night out. <laughs> Don't do it, folks. Do not do it. The second, more important observation was the degree to which everyone, and I mean everyone, in the business of tourism has a huge personal stake and emotional investment in their work and in this industry. There's real passion and pride involved in presenting Northern Ireland's best face to the world. However, for a long time, we were tourism's best kept secret. But I'm pleased to say that during my time as chairman, we did begin to reap the rewards of sustained investment in developing what is a truly world-class product. And it's thanks to you, all of you in this industry for that. We were helped in no small part by events like the Open and the huge success of Game of Thrones and more recently Derry Girls in raising Northern Ireland's profile internationally. When COVID struck, we were also in the process of rolling out an inspiring and exciting new experience brand. Northern Ireland embraced a giant spirit, but it barely scratched the surface of the possibilities that it undoubtedly presents for this industry. Initially, as chairman, I inherited a role representing an industry that was going from strength to strength in terms of visitor numbers and revenues. And we finally hit that ambitious goal mentioned earlier by John of a billion pounds annual spend. Think of that. This little place with but 1.8 million people, and we hit a billion pounds of revenue at the end of 2019, immediately before everything shut down. It's easy to feel pride in an industry which is prospering in that way, but what has made me proudest of all was seeing how our industry responded to the challenges presented by the pandemic. How did they respond? With steadfastness, with adaptability, and with a willingness to innovate in order to survive and to recover. The efforts of our industry were matched by a huge commitment from John McCrillan, his senior management team, and all our staff at Tourism NI in supporting you to get our industry back on its feet and prospering again. Above all else, being part of that has proven to be the most rewarding thing about my entire time as chairman of Tourism NI. We're now beginning in earnest the work of recovery, and there will be further challenges, no doubt, in the years ahead, not least the way in which the cost of living crisis 
will inevitably affect visitors' spending power. I know that you'll face those challenges, as you always have, with energy, agility, and that giant spirit that is the best, the very best of our qualities. I hope that today has given you some fresh ideas to take away to support you along the way. As I step down, I wish to pay tribute to all, all of our staff in Tourism NI, and to extend my very best wishes to the incoming chair. I also wish to place on record my thanks to a very talented, committed, and passionate team of people who have guided, advised, and supported me through the entire time of my tenure. So firstly, it is thanks to the executive support team who, despite my best efforts, always got me to the right place, at the right time, with the right brief, enabling me to relax in the knowledge that they were making me look better than I actually am, and that's a hard job. That's some feat. So thank you to the executive support team. Secondly, my thanks to John's senior management team, the SMT, for the skills, the knowledge, and experience that they bring, but more importantly, for their tireless dedication to the cause and their seemingly inexhaustible energy. Thirdly, I wish to thank all of my board colleagues, yes, even Terry McCartney. Together you have brought to bear all, all of the key attributes that a chair values. Wisdom, support, challenge, commitment, loyalty, focus, and most importantly when working with me, forbearance. And finally, I am sure that no one else will mind me saying, most importantly, my thanks go to our CEO, John McGrung. John, I can say without hesitation that throughout my career in both the public and the private sectors, I have not worked with a better CEO ever. Your selfless approach, your intellect, your insights, your political nous, your capacity for sheer hard work and your never say die attitude all mark you out as a special leader. John, I've learned so much from you and I feel privileged to have worked with you over these past seven challenging but truly wonderful years. Thank you, John. Thank you. And to all, to all of you who work in our industry, I wish each and every one of you the best of success for the future of your business, your employees, our industry, and this place we all love. Thank you. round of applause again for Terence Brannigan, who's done a sterling job over the last seven years. Very emotional, but lovely. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the conference today. I hope you've got lots of takeaways. And uh, on behalf of uh, Tourism NI, thank you for coming here today. Good luck with your businesses and the challenges and opportunities, but of course, great expectations ahead. Um, before we leave, I, I've got to tell you it's very important now if you're not signed up already to Tourism NI's mailing lists, please do so via tourismni.com. And also remember we're here until half past three today in the foyer to answer any questions you might have, maybe some ideas that came up today and you'd like to explore them further. But we leave you now before we head off for lunch with Tourism NI's new family campaign, which goes live on the 13th of June for the summer. So here is a sneak preview. The six week campaign will be underpinned by a comprehensive PR strategy in both markets and details on how the industry can get involved will be shared very, very soon. Take care. See you soon.